A very good afternoon, everyone. I take an immense pleasure in welcoming you all, dear ISANs, to the ISA National Webinar, the topic of which is Living Donor Liver Transplantation Anesthesiologist Perspective. I now invite Dr. Naveen Malhotra, sir, Honorary Secretary, ISA National, to deliver his welcome address. Good afternoon, dear ISANs. Greetings from ISA National Headquarters. Welcome to ISA National Webinar on Living Donor Liver Transplantation Anesthesiologist Perspective. Dr. S. Bala Baskar, Chairman ISA Academy Committee, Dr. Murli Joshi, President ISA National, Dr. Suresh Bhargav, Vice President ISA National, Dr. Virendra Sharma, Treasurer ISA National, Dr. Lalit Mandiratta, Editor-in-Chief, Indian Journal of Anesthesia, and very, very respected Professor Dr. Deepak Tempe, sir, the webinar coordinator, and his team for planning this webinar on such an important clinical topic. I am very sure that the delegates' knowledge will be enriched by the deliberations during this webinar. There is an increasing demand of liver transplant in our country. Although cadaveric liver transplant is catering to this need, but it is not sufficient. And thus, living donor liver transplant is essential. There is a fear amongst the recipients that something may happen to their relatives, the donors. And that makes them reluctant for undergoing living donor liver transplant. By ensuring safe perioperative period for both recipients and donors, anesthesiologists play a very vital role in living donor liver transplantation. I am extremely thankful to Dr. Deepak Tempe, sir, and the esteemed faculty of this webinar who shall be sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today afternoon. Indian Society of Anesthesiologists is always committed to clinical and academic activities under its banner at all levels. Last year, at the peak of COVID pandemic, Indian Society of Anesthesiologists conducted the first ever virtual event of anesthesia in India, the first annual conference of UA ISA, the UA ISACON on 5th and 6th September 2020. Subsequently, ISA National promoted and some supported all its state branches to conduct their state conferences virtually. And I'm very happy to share with you that almost every weekend from October 2020 to March 2021, one or other activities was occurring by different state branches, city branches of ISA across the country. Now the state conferences are over. So we are restarting our ISA national webinars in the current uh, financial year. Although the second peak of COVID is looming large on us, but we, the anesthesiologists, are prepared to do our COVID clinical duties also, and at the same time, continue with the academic and clinical programs. Thank you very much. Long live ISA. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now invite Dr. S. Balabhaska, sir, Chairman ISA Academic Committee, to deliver his address. Greetings to everybody. President ISA National, Dr. Mulidhar Joshi, Secretary Dr. Naveen Madhotra, and the Chief Coordinator for the specialty today, Dr. Deepak, Deepak Tempe. It's a very good program that is uh, arranged for a special field, a living donor liver transplantation today from an anesthesiologist perspective. So whenever we talk about uh, liver, at least two to three special things come in mind, in mind when related to transplant anesthesia. One thing is uh, we don't have an option of uh, a bypass system, which is normally applicable to other transplant uh, uh, options. Secondly, we are more bothered about the blood management, the correlation management in the patients. 
and of course uh, medical legal concerns persist uh, for any type of uh, transplant procedures and we as anesthesiologists are really the perioperative physicians uh, in a case like uh, liver transplant so it is uh, good that we have a program that is uh, to be discussed today with uh, authorities in the field from uh, within india and outside india who are also participating so on behalf of the academic committee of ias national i wish the program all the success and thank dr deepak tempe once again for uh, taking the lead and see that uh, uh, we have this academic fiesta today i hope all our members will uh, take benefit out of this program thank you very much long live ias thank you sir it's a pleasure to invite dr murli dhar joshi president ias national to deliver his presidential address so please respect chairman academic committee dr bala bhaskar president elect dr venkat giri vice president dr suresh bhargava honorary secretary dr navin malhotra honorary treasurer dr virendra sharma editor in chief dr lalit mehdi ratta the gc member from north zone dr sukhmendra bajwa and dr raju gupta and all the gc members good afternoon to everyone i am very happy to share with you today's is webinar which is sponsored by is national on the living liver donor transplantation and anesthesiologist perspective this particular topic is very important these days and uh, i should congratulate the webinar coordinator dr deepak tempe and all the faculty members for choosing such a topic because these days we are seeing in our country lot of non alcoholic cirrhosis conditions which might warrant in the coming years a liver transplantation though it appears a bit expensive procedure at this stage but over course of time things will definitely be is of a much better way and i am sure today what a knowledge they are going to impart to all of us who are participating for this particular event will be useful in our day to day clinical practice and i am sure this program will be a great success i would like to congratulate dr deepak tempe the webinar coordinator and all the faculty members for taking up this task i wish you all the success long live isa jai hind thank you thank you sir to begin our session i would like to call our first chair person dr manish tandon senior consultant head of department of anesthesia dhamshila narayan super specialty hospital delhi his areas of interest include anesthesia for abdominal organ transplant head and neck and gi onco surgery cardiac surgery he has had 38 publications his achievements include highest ranking abstract nwac 2015 2016 Travel Bursary MCLD 2015 and Best Paper ISSP Com 2007. Our next uh, chairperson is Dr. Ashish Malik, Fellow, Transplant Anesthesia, LHSC Canada, Senior Consultant Anesthesia and Critical Care at Indraprasth Apollo Hospital, New Delhi. His areas of interest include liver transplant anesthesia and critical care. He has had numerous publications in national and international journals. He is a member of Anesthesia and Critical Care Committee (ILTS) and founding member Anesthesia (GCLTSI). To call upon our first speaker, Dr. Vimy Rewari, Professor, Department of Anesthesiology, Pain Medicine and Critical Care, AIMS, New Delhi. Her areas of interest include hepatobiliary and liver transplant, critical care. acute pain difficult airway and simulation dr vimy rewari ma'am i would like to request you to give your uh, speech on the topic of liver donor open hepatectomy anesthesia concerns my name is vimy rewari and i'm a professor in the department of anesthesiology pain medicine and critical care at the all india institute of medical sciences new delhi and i'm going to be talking about the anesthesia concerns in patients undergoing live donor open hepatectomy 
So in the next 20 minutes or so, I will be giving you a brief introduction followed by the primary anesthetic goals, the uh, preoperative assessment of the donor, the intraoperative monitoring and other concerns, postoperative management, especially pertaining to postoperative analgesia, and align it with this short summary. So as we all know, live donor liver transplant is a very viable alternative to the deceased donor transplantation and is of tremendous benefit to the recipient population. However, one should not forget that this is one of the very major surgeries, which is associated with the mortality of about 0.1 to 2%, 0.2%, and a morbidity of as high as 25 to 35%. And in fact, this is one of the major limiting factors in the development and expansion of the LDLT program. Therefore, without doubt, donor safety is and should remain paramount or in the management of these patients. So before we go on to the anesthetic management, uh, a few words about the surgical procedure itself. Uh, for an adult liver transplantation, the right lobe hepatectomy is done, and for a pediatric liver transplant, the left lobe hepatectomy is done. The incision can be variable. It could be a Chevron or a Mercedes-Benz incision, a hockey stick incision or an upper midline incision, depending on the surgeon's preference. This is followed by the mobilization of the liver, the identification of the hepatic veins, the dissection of the hilum, clamping of the vessels, followed by the resection of the liver lobe. It is always ensured that the residual weight to the total liver weight is more than 30%. So the primary aim of anesthesia for living donor hepatectomy is to minimize the risks associated with the surgery. And this is achieved by ensuring hemodynamic stability during the surgery uh, to target and maintain organ perfusion, use of techniques to reduce blood loss and providing optimal conditions for surgical dissection. One should diagnose and treat all metabolic disturbances, especially metabolic acidosis, and ensure normal hernia during the surgery. Before the patient or the donor is seen by the anesthesia team, uh, they have actually undergone a rigorous assessment by the liver transplant team with history and physical examination, the various blood tests, imaging, consultations by the medical and the psychiatric departments, in association with additional evaluations such as pulmonary function tests, cardiology consultations, and echocardiograms in high-risk patients. So the preoperative anesthesia assessment should, be, uh, should remain independent from the donor selection process. And during the uh, preoperative visits, beside the physical examination and looking at the investigations, one should counsel the patient, patients about the possibility of postoperative pain uh, in fact, a study or survey by, by Middleton et al. showed that almost one third of the donors felt that postoperative pain was worse than was explained to them. All the donors should be given the various options available for pain management and help them decide the correct option. If uh, blood loss is a problem, then preoperative blood conservation in the form of autologous transfusion should be explained to the patient. These patients are very anxious and should be prescribed antibiotics in the form of short-acting benzodiazepines in the preoperative period. In the pre-induction room, uh, IV antibiotics should be administered to prevent the surgical site infection. Thromboprophylaxis is generally administered the night before with low molecular weight heparin and interoperative use of pneumatic compression devices. A large pore IV access is established. Standard ASA monitoring is applied. And uh, thoracic epidural at the level of T6 to T8 is uh, inserted with the help of local anesthesia. The anesthetic management is comprises of a balanced general anesthetic technique. And during anesthesia induction, a short-acting opioid such as fentanyl or remifentanyl, whichever is available, is used along with propofol and atracurium. Maintenance of anesthesia is generally carried out with oxygen in air and isoflurane and with, uh, with neuromuscular blockade uh, with the use of atricurium. Now then we come to the main question, should, we, should one use volatile anesthetic agents or total intravenous anesthesia with propofort? 
So a uh, volatile anesthetic agents are generally uh, lead to reduced hepatic blood flow. They are metabolized by the liver, and some of them or some of their byproducts can lead to hepatotoxicity. However, studies have shown that they promote pharmacological reconditioning, which is nitric oxide mediated, which can attenuate liver injury and improve clinical outcomes. Total intravenous anesthesia with propofol is also a safe technique which has been used extensively in this group of patients. However, sometimes they may lead to a higher bilirubin prothrombin time and creatinine in the postoperative period. They are also seen, this technique is also shown to be associated with increased bleeding, probably because of the fact that propofol increases the hepatic blood flow. Now, this recent study looked at uh, two group of patients who were a randomized controlled trial, uh, which uh, looked at propofol intravenous anesthesia uh, compared to desiloran alone on post-operative liver function and found that liver function tests and creatinine were similar between the two groups. Also, there was no difference in the post-operative complications, including acute kidney injury. So both of these techniques, depending on the anesthesiologist choice, can be safely administered. Interoperative monitoring uh, starts with the insertion of a radial artery catheter to monitor invasive blood pressure, as well as use it for monitoring the cardiac output uh, using non-invasive cardiac output monitors such as PICO, LITCO, and FlowTrack. Temperature monitoring is essential, and interoperative warming devices have to be used to maintain normothermia. Union output measurement and use of neuromuscular monitoring is also used in these patients. Central venous axis is generally taken in, this, in these patients for two reasons. One, for management of central venous pressure, and if there is need for administration of vasoactive agents. Use of large veins such as internal jugular vein and subclavian uh, come with their own set of complications, such as carotid artery puncture, uh, arterial puncture, or uh, pneumothorax. So some um, anesthesiologists prefer placing a peripherally inserted central venous catheter. However, the precise placement of these catheters is always questionable. Some authors also advocate use of a 16-gate cannula in the external jugular vein, which is shown to be correlating well with CVP. This study by Abdullah looked at 40 adult living liver donors where they did paired measurements of venous pressures from the external jugular and the internal jugular and found that they were within acceptable limits of bias measurements, plus minus two millimeters of mercury. So this is an alternative. Next, we come to uh, the uh, management of fluids interoperatively and the fluid of choice is always crystalloids. Uh, artificial colloids are known to have to affect the coagulation as well as affect kidney uh, function and therefore are best avoided. Crystalloids, the choices between normal saline, ringer lactate and plasma light. Normal saline um, is large volumes of normal saline are known to cause metabolic acidosis and also cause acute kidney injury in the post-operative period. And therefore, uh, the choices between plasma light versus ringer lactate. The uh, ring lactate in the ringers is uh, not efficiently metabolized because of the hepatectomy and can lead to higher post-operative lactate levels. So the choice for intraoperative fluid remains plasma light. So how do we administer fluids? So there are two methods, either we guide it using CVP or the stroke volume variation. So coming first to CVP guided fluid management. So why CVP? Because central venous pressure is an indirect reflection of the hepatic sinusoid pressure and lowering CVP reduces the hepatic parenchymal congestion and thus the bleeding associated with the section. So the CVP that is targeted is generally five millimeters of mercury or less. And various studies have shown that keeping the CVP lower than five millimeters of mercury decreases the intraoperative blood loss, the need for blood transfusion, and also reduces the morbidity and mortality. However, on the other hand, this study uh, by Kim uh, looked at around 1,000 living donors and found that there was no correlation between the CVP and intraoperative blood loss, even though the mean CVP in all these patients was less than five. 
They found that the major predictors of hemorrhage were the fatty changes in the liver, gender, and body weight. A systematic review and meta-analysis which looked at central venous pressure and liver resection found that lowering the CVP reduces the estimated blood loss, the rates of blood transmission. However, there was no difference in the rate of morbidity. Also, they were not able to identify the correct or the optimal method of CVP reduction. Coming next to the stroke volume variation guided fluid management, which is depicted by the flow track video by Edward Life Sciences. And uh, this algorithm, which is proposed by Choi in, and published in World Journal of Gastroenterology in 2015, they found that keeping the stroke volume variation between 10 to 20 percent leads to lesser blood loss. So they, uh, according to their algorithm, if the SVV is between 10 to 20 percent, the infusion rate of fluid should be three to four ml per kg per hour. However, if the SVV is still less than 10 percent, then one should reduce the infusion rate to two ml per kg per hour. And if required, one can give a bolus of Lasix or Furos Lasix to uh, increase the urine output. After hepatectomy, the infusion rate is then increased to 8 to 10 ml per kg per hour. So this study looked at the effect of stroke volume variation guided fluid management on blood loss during living donor hepatectomy and found that the blood loss was significantly less in patients who had a higher stroke volume variation. 476 ml versus 836 ml in the control group. However, blood pressure and lab values were not different between the groups. They also found that CVP was significantly lower in the high CSVV group. Low CVP, however, comes with its own set of problems. Uh, it can lead to reduced tissue perfusion, especially acute kidney injury. Sudden blood loss, such as a nick in the IVC, can lead to a sudden blood, uh, severe hypovolemia. And the risk of air embolism always remains because of the reduced venous pressure. So the restrictive fluid therapy, how does it affect the outcome? This study uh, was a retrospective analysis of about 167 patients where they uh, administered restrictive fluid to uh, restrictive fluid therapy to these patients before the hepatectomy 3 ml per kg per hour and after hepatectomy 9 ml per kg per hour, the CVP decreased from 10 to 8 millimeters of mercury. The urine output remained almost the same before hepatectomy 1.5 ml per kg per hour and after hepatectomy 1.8 ml per kg per hour. Intraoperative estimated blood loss was extremely low, about 90 ml. None of the patients required blood transfusion and their hemoglobin remained stable. In addition, there was no derangement of renal function in any of these patients. So as I mentioned before, the intraoperative blood loss, especially with the improvements in surgical techniques nowadays is extremely low. However, on average, it is about 500 ml, ranging from 72 ml to 2 liters, with a transfusion rate varying from 1 to 5 percent. The various blood conservation techniques that can be applied in these patients is keeping a very low central venous pressure, which can be done by using a restrictive fluid therapy, use of diuretics, uh, producing vasodilatation with an epidural block, using high concentration of inhalational agents, using drugs such as nitroglycerin and mildrinol. Acute normovolemic hemodilution, autologous transfusion, and cell savage were used once upon a time but are no longer used or indicated. In the post-operative period, these patients are often shifted to a high dependency unit or ICU and kept there for almost 48 hours. One should keep a lookout for post-operative bleeding. Lab investigations in the form of publishing profile, thrombolastography, and AVGs look out, look out for lactate levels should be done in the post-operative period. One of the primary concerns and in the post-operative period is the pain. And one should ensure that these patients are pain-free. 
donors are very healthy individuals who have a very high expectations for a fast recovery and they are very less tolerant of post operative pain and therefore it is mandatory that they should have adequate anesthesia so that they can return to a normal physiological function psychological stability which leads to an enhanced recovery so when we talk about the post operative pain in these group of patients uh, this study looked at uh, the post operative pain in patients who underwent a uh, donor hepatectomy as compared to a major hepatic resection for tumor both these groups had thoracic epidurals and similar surgical exposure however pain in the donor hepatectomy was 2.76 times more likely as compared to major hepatic resection in fact the average pain scores as well as the average number of doses required for pain relief was much higher in patients who were who underwent a donor hepatectomy as compared to patients who underwent a major hepatic resection for tumor now this study looked at the acute and chronic post surgical pain after uh, live liver donation and found that the moderate to severe pain at rest on on movement on day 1 was as high as 42% and 74% and day 2 was 33% and 32% respectively at the 6 months the 31% of the patients had post surgical pain and at 12 months 27% of the patients had chronic pain So what happens if the patients have inadequate post-operative management? Yeah, they experience intense acute pain, which leads to increased increased sympathetic activity, which reduces the regional blood flow and therefore promotes ischemia. The fear and anxiety associated with acute pain leads to lack of sleep and lack of cooperation, which leads to a difficulty in rehabilitation. Acute pain and in the upper abdominal region leads to restricted breathing and reduced movement of the diaphragm. promoting atelectasis hypercapnia hypoxia and predisposing them to pneumonias acute pain also leads to decreased immune response and therefore increased susceptibility to infection or sepsis persistence of acute pain or untreated acute pain makes them more likely to have chronic pain So this study published in JAMA Surgery in 2014 looked at perioperative complications in 555 patients who underwent live donor hepatectomy and they found that the most common perioperative complication in 41% of the patients was respiratory in nature and of these 26% were because of atelectasis. So what do we uh, what are the options that are available for post operative analgesia and living donor hepatectomy the most common are neuraxial analgesia and intravenous analgesia uh, along with continuous wound infiltration of local anesthetic some of the newer upcoming modes of analgesia which have not really been tried in this group of patients is paraneuraxial analgesia in the form of paravertebral block or erector spinal plane block and truncal nerve blocks such as tap block and qwell block Thoracic epidural analgesia, as we all know, is the gold standard as it provides effective segmental analgesia, blunts very operative neuroendocrine stress response, and aids in early mobilization and post-operative rehabilitation. This study looked at the advantages of epidural analgesia on pulmonary function and liver transplant donors and found that use of epidural analgesia led to better post-operative analgesia, reduced atelectasis scores, and preserved pulmonary function tests. However, uh, there are concerns about use of thoracic epidural analgesia. There is a risk of epidural hematoma because of the persistence of post-operative coagulopathy. Also, use of local anesthetics in the epidural can lead to hypotension, which can in turn predispose the patient to excessive transfusion, liver hypoperfusion, or acute kidney injury. so what about coagulation profile and the use of epidural catheter uh, this study looked at the changes in coagulation profile and epidural catheter safety for living liver donors uh, in 360 donors of which 242 had an epidural catheter insertion and they also looked at the platelet count pt and abtt for 7 days after surgery the catheter was removed on post op day 3 or 4 in 75% of the patients as you can see 
here the platelet count, the PT and the APTP uh, had a maximum derangement on day two, after which they started improving. So they concluded that uh, epidural catheters appear to be safe in live liver donors as there was no epidural hematoma in any of the patients, despite post-op population derangements. In a recent study, uh, in, a, in a recent study from India, uh, from Gangaram, the, uh, the authors looked at 104 patients with thoracic capital analgesia for uh, total hepatectomy. And they also found that there were no epidural hematomas and provided very good perioperative analgesia. Intrathecal morphine is also a good option. Uh, it provides very good quality analgesia for 24 hours. There is decreased use of IV analgesics and there is no risk of hematoma. However, uh, it is associated with increased incidence of pruritus, nausea, vomiting, and respiratory depression. Continuous wound inflation of local anesthetics, anesthetics are often uh, used by many centers because it blocks afferent pain transmission from surgical site, inhibits the inflammatory response to injury, and reduces the risk of hyperalgesia. And the uh, added advantage is that it's simple and inexpensive. It has a very good safety profile and can be used as part of the multimodal analgesia. IV opioids are, again, the main state of treatment of post-operative pain and is the technique of choice in many centers. Using an IV PCA with either fentanyl or morphine, it can be used alone or as part of the multimodal analgesia. So which one is better? IV morphine or uh, ep thoracic epidural. So this study looked at uh, effects of two different techniques of post-operative analgesia, that is PCI IV morphine or patient-controlled epidural analgesia with morphine, and found that epidural mor morphine via patient-controlled epidural analgesia is significant, significantly reduced the post-operative VAS force and 24-hour morphine consumption. Also, the systematic review on the use of uh, patient controlled analgesia compared with epidural analgesia after open hepatic reception, which involved four RCTs with 278 patients, found thoracic epidural to be superior to IVPCA for pain control. In addition, there was no difference in hospital length of stay or any kind of complications. So, to summarize, uh, the good anesthetic outcome uh, in patients with undergoing uh, Live donor hepatectomy depends on a, a sound preoperative anesthesia assessment, counseling for postoperative pain, use of appropriate monitoring intraoperatively, maintaining perfusion to the liver and other vital organs, reducing blood loss, and provision of adequate postoperative analgesia. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now I would like to call upon our second speaker, Dr. Neha Garg. Associate Professor, Department of Anesthesiology, ILBS Delhi. Her areas of interest include pediatric liver transplantation, fluid management during transplantation, post-operative pain management, TEE, GI surgery. She has had 20 publications in national and international journals of repute, including five book chapters. She has conducted more than 200 liver transplant recipient and donor ISNACC Best Paper awarded to her in 2014. Ma'am, I would like to give, invite you to give your talk on the topic of pre-operative evaluation of liver recipient. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Neha Garg, and today I will be talking about pre-operative evaluation of liver transplant recipients. So a brief overview about my talk today. We will be discussing who are the patients who need transplantation? When do they need transplantation? and how do we have to evaluate these patients for transplantation. So who are these patients who need transplantation? We need to find the etiology of the end-stage liver disease in all these cases. Of, it may be due to cirrhosis, it may be due to acute liver failure, or it may be due to acute and chronic liver failure. So why is disease etiology important? It is important because there are many diseases which not just affect liver, but they affect other systemic organs also, such as the heart. So one such disease is alcoholic liver disease. Alcoholic liver disease is also the most common cause of cirrhosis in India. It leads to dilated cardiomyopathy and coronary artery disease, due to which the cardiovascular evaluation becomes very important in these patients. 
Similarly, patients with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis have metabolic syndrome and are at very high risk of coronary artery disease. In fact, coronary vascular disease is the leading cause of mortality in these patients. Studies have found out that carotid intimal thickness, which is a surrogate marker of atherosclerosis, is very high in these patients compared to the healthy adults, and thus they are at a very high risk of cardiovascular events in the perioperative period. Then there are diseases in which hypercoagulability may be present, such as primary biliary cirrhosis, primary sclerosing cholangitis, malignancy, and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And we have to be very cautious about these in the perioperative period. Then there might be diseases which affect the kidney, like polycystic kidney disease and primary hyperoxaluria. In these, both these diseases, the patient may even be on renal replacement therapy in the preoperative period, and we need to look into these in the preoperative period for these uh, patients. Then patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency may have emphysema and thus may need, may have severe obstructive lung disease and a decreased lung, uh, diffusion capacity in the preoperative period. And these have to be looked into in the preoperative period and optimized as much as possible. Then we must also look whether the patient has any contraindications uh, to liver transplantation or not. In the absence of any significant comorbidities, even older patients more than 70 years is not a contraindication for liver transplantation. Obese patients, that is obesity class three, that is more than 40 BMI is a relative contraindication to liver transplantation and all obese patients must undergo dietary counseling before undergoing liver transplantation. So when are the po pa patients posted for liver transplantation? Any patient with MELD more than 15 is listed for liver transplantation. MELD and CTB score were measures of severity of the disease in the preoperative period, but they also tell us about the postoperative morbidity and mortality in patients undergoing liver transplantation. In this study, the, they, find, they found out that patients with MELD more than 25 were having poorer survival than those patients with lower MELD. Thus, it is important to assess the MELD in the preoperative period. Next, coming to how are these patients evaluated? Various systemic examinations have to be done. First, I will be talking about the cardiovascular system examination. So any patient undergoing liver transplantation may have ischemic heart disease, cirrhotic cardi cardiomyopathy, systolic and diastolic dysfunction, heart failure, portopulmonary hypertension, or a prolonged QTC interval. The prevalence of coronary artery disease may be as high as 26% in liver transplant recipients. It is actually equal to or even more than the healthy, healthy adults. Thus, we need to evaluate all the patients for coronary artery disease. American Journal of Cardiology in 2006 published certain risk factors, which were age more than 50, male gender, hypertension, altered lipid metabolism, diabetes, and obesity. And presence of two or more risk factors placed the patient at moderate to severe risk of coronary artery disease and had to be evaluated for the presence of coronary artery disease in detail. So why is coronary artery disease a problem? Because it leads to worse outcome. In fact, studies have found out that the one year mortality is as high as 40% after liver transplantation in patients with CAD. Coming to cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, these patients have a blunt treat contractile responsiveness to stress. They have diastolic dysfunction and electrophysiological abnormality. Because of the release of uh, toxins from the GI tract due to portal hypertension, they develop hyperdynamic syndrome, diastolic and systolic dysfunction, exercise intolerance, and prolonged QTC. In these, con uh, all these things, in uh, when there are precipitating factors such as liver transplantation and sepsis may land up in heart failure, pulmonary edema, shock, cardiorenal syndrome, or arrhythmias. Thus, we need to be very particular about patients with cirrhotic cardiomyopathy in perioperative period. Diastolic dysfunction, it often precedes the systolic dysfunction or both of them may be coexistent. That it may result in pulmonary edema and heart failure following liver transplantation. Systolic dysfunction, it is mostly latent in patients undergoing cirrhosis, in undergoing liver transplantation for cirrhosis, and it is because of decreased beta adrenergic receptor activity and negative inotropic effect. It may also re uh, result in a very high incidence of pulmonary edema. It leads to a shift, of, shift to right 
of the left ventricular pressure volume curve. So we need to also look into the systolic dysfunction of the patient. Next, coming to prolonged QTC interval, as the child scores increase in patients with cirrhosis, the QTC interval increases. And it, the problem with increased QTC interval it, is that it may lead to sudden cardiac death after liver transplantation. So how do we evaluate for all these conditions? ECG is done in all the patients as initial screening test. Non-invasive stress testing, that is dobutamine stress echocardiography is also done in all the patients. Most of the patients, they cannot undergo exercise testing. Thus, dobutamine stress echocardiography is preferred. Uh, transthoracic echocardiography is done again in all the patients. And coronary calcium scoring and coronary angiogram, these are reserved for those patients which are very, which are very high risk of coronary artery disease. Dobutamine stress echocardiography, it has got a very high negative predictive value due to which it can be used as a good screening tool for patients, uh, for the patients undergoing liver transplantation to evaluate them for the presence or absence of coronary artery disease. And if this test is found positive, the patient must undergo coronary angiography to confirm the presence of any coronary artery disease. Next, transthoracic echocardiography is done in all the patients who are undergoing liver transplantation to evaluate them for the cardiac chamber sizes, presence of any valvular dysfunction, systolic and diastolic dysfunction, pulmonary artery pressures, presence of any intracardiac shunts, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, or pericardial effusion. So what are the common echocardiographic findings that we find in patients with cirrhosis? Most of the patients have a LA dilatation. You can see in the echocardiographic figure that the LA is very much dilated. Then there might be increased pulmonary and systemic flows. There might be an elevated or normal right ventricular pressure. There might be uh, elevated end diastolic volume and stroke volume. And finally, there might be an increase in the pulmonary artery pressure. Also, we, might, we commonly find the diastolic dysfunction in these patients. At times, we may also find that ascites is very huge and it causes pseudokinesis, pseudodiskinesis of the left ventricular wall. Coming to coronary calcium scoring, it tells us about the calcium plaques in the coronary arteries a score of more than 400, the patient is at very high risk of single vessel disease. And it has again got a very good negative predictive value. And any patient with coronary calcium scoring may need coronary angiogram if the score is positive to make the definitive diagnosis. The disadvantage is that it may lead to contrast induced renal impairment and the patient needs to hold the breath. And most of the patients with cirrhosis, they have tensicitis and they cannot hold the breath. Coming to coronary angiogram, coronary angiogram is done in cases of abnormal non-invasive test or a high pretest probability of coronary artery disease. So to sum up uh, for cardiovascular evaluation, any patient with a high suspicion of coronary artery disease or a previous history of coronary artery disease must undergo a coronary angiogram. If there is no high suspicion, still the patient has to undergo a non-invasive ischemic test. And if it is positive, again, an angiogram is done. Otherwise, if it is negative, we can proceed for liver transplantation. Then the patient also has to undergo a transthoracic echocardiography to find out other problems. And if we find that there is any severe volvular abnormality or pericardial, severe pericardial effusion or diastolic and systolic functions are very high grade or there might be a high heart failure. In all these conditions, we have to refer them to a cardiologist for optimization of the condition and to for risk stratification. Coronary stenting prior to liver transplantation. The problem with coronary stenting prior to liver transplantation is that these patients have uh, are under dual antiplatelet and at a very high risk of bleeding. So for bare metal stent, we have to at least wait for one month before liver transplantation. And for drug eluting stent, we must wait for six months. However, the timing of liver transplantation after coronary stenting has to be in with individualized based on the urgency of procedure and the risk of bleeding. Coming to pulmonary evaluation, these patients undergoing liver transplantation for cirrhosis, they may have hepatopulmonary syndrome, photopulmonary syndrome. They may have a restrictive lung disease due to hepatic hydrothorax, tense ascites, and interstitial lung edema, or they may have respiratory muscle wasting. 
So we have to take thorough history and examination from all the patients relevant to the pulmonary uh, system. The screening methods that are used are chest radiography, pulse oximetry, and lung function test. And for diagnosis of particular diseases, we must get an arterial blood gas analysis. Any alveolar arterial difference more than 15 suggests that it may be hepatopulmonary syndrome. A contrast echocardiography may be again done to confirm the presence of hepatopulmonary syndrome. And a technetium labeled macro aggregated albumin scan is also done for hepatopulmonary syndrome. So the International Liver Transplant Society gave us practice guidelines for HPS. And any patient with severe hepatopulmonary syndrome, they had to be expedited for liver transplantation. Initially, pulse oximetry has to be done as a screening test. And if the saturation is found to be less than 96%, an ABG must be done to find the alveolar arterial gradient. Next, to find out intrapulmonary vascular dilatations, our saline contrast echocardiography was recommended. And to differentiate whether the hypoxemia was due to HPS or due to other intrinsic cardiopulmonary disease, an MAA scan was uh, proposed. So this is a video showing that uh, saline echocardiographic, uh, saline contrast and transthoracic echocardiography in which we find that air bubbles are right now in the uh, right side. And if the air bubbles, they come on the left side, after the third cardiac cycle, it means that there are uh, intrapulmonary vascular, ventric vascular dilatations. If they come before that, it means that there are uh, intracardiac shunts. So we see in this that the bubbles are coming here after the third cycle, indicating that there are intrapulmonary vascular dilatations. Next, coming to recommendations for portopulmonary hypertension. Initial screening had to be performed with a transthoracic Doppler echocardiography. And if we find that the right ventricular systolic pressures are high, then a right heart catheterization is advised to find out the hemodynamics of POPH if they are present or not. If the mean pulmonary artery pressure is consistent with moderate to severe pulmonary, uh, art, pulmonary hypertension, then a PA targeted therapy is indicated. And if there is a severe POPH, then there is an absolute uh, contraindication to liver transplantation. Next, coming to renal dysfunction. The renal dysfunction in patients undergoing liver transplantation can be as high as 30%. The problems with renal dysfunction uh, pre-existing to liver transplantation is that the patient's survival is poorer. There is increased cost, increased sepsis, longer ICUC stays and there is a need for dialysis in the post-transplant period. Thus, it is very important to optimize the renal function in the preoperative period. And the problem with renal evaluation is that creatinine, which is most commonly used to find out the renal function, is lesser in patients with cirrhosis because of the lower muscle mass. Newer markers for AKI have been diagnosed, such as cystatin C and neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin, but both these are expensive and they are not routinely available. So they are not currently in much of use. So to evaluate for renal dysfunction, first we have to see whether the GFR is normal or not. If the GFR is abnormal, then we have to find out by the history and previous test whether it is acute condition or a chronic condition. If it is an acute condition, then we have to see whether it is pre-renal, parenchymal, or obstruction. And we have to try and correct these in the preoperative period. If it is Hepatorenal syndrome, then we must see if there is any improvement with diuretic withdrawal or albumin infusion. And again, we must try and correct the hepatorenal syndrome before taking up the patient for liver transplantation. Next, we must also look into it that the patient does not have any metabolic disturbances uh, like electrolyte disturbances just before taking up the patient for liver transplantation and whether these things need to be corrected with dialysis before transplantation. And if dialysis is needed, then we have to also see whether we need to do a simultaneous liver kidney transplant or only liver transplantation. Coming to coagulation system, routinely the coagulation tests are done before surgery, but there is no correction is needed before surgery. This is because no link has been found between coagulation defects and bleeding, and it is neither useful nor necessary to correct the coagulation defects with plasma before liver transplantation. In fact, the correction of coagulation 
before taking up the patient for transplantation has not been found to decrease the intraoperative red blood cell transfusion and it has sometimes found to be contrary so what is the problem with transfusing the patients preoperatively because it increases the portal pressure and it also increases the transfusion reactions in the perioperative period coming to the cns system examination we must assess the patient for hepatic encephalopathy and grading especially in case of acute liver failure and in case of acute liver failure we must also assess the presence of cerebral edema by various measures such as optic nerve sheaf diameter by ct scan by transcranial doppler and by pupillary reactions and we must try and give the therapy for uh, decreasing the cerebral edema before acute liver failure coming to glucose and electrolytes hypoglycemia is very common in acute liver failure and must be corrected in the preoperative period and for electrolytes sodium and potassium have to be optimized before taking up the surgery this is important because decreased sodium leads to a short term uh, decreased graft survival and also an increase in the sepsis renal dysfunction and encephalopathy in the perioperative period hypernatremia has also been found to be detrimental to the patients and it should be corrected before taking up the patients for surgery as it leads to greater mortality and higher requirements for renal support and ventilation after transplantation lastly we must not forget that we must know what is the grade of varices grade 3 4 esophageal varices or gastric varices is a contraindication to transthoracic echocardiography all cultures must be negative before taking up the patient for transplantation we must also know about the nutritional status of the patient and the presence and absence of sarcopenia ascites must be assessed and patients with ascites may be on diuretics thus we must take care the sodium and the potassium level of these patients in the perioperative period then we must know the serology of the patient and the psychological assessment must be done before taking up the patients for transplantation lastly a few words about covid disease we must screen all the patients for symptoms and fever before calling from home for transplantation ideally transplantation in positive candidates should be delayed for at least 14 to 21 days after symptom resolution and at least we must get one or two rt pcr sample negative the decision to proceed for transplantation in a candidate must be however individualized based on the urgency of the procedure the severity of the covid disease whether there are any systemic disease or respiratory involvement of in case of covid and also when the exposure of the team to must be taken into account this is a slide which is telling us the various organs that we have to look into like uh, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy hepatopulmonary and photopulmonary syndrome varicell hemorrhages cytopenias sarcopenias hepatorenal syndrome and hepatic encephalopathy thank you thank you ma'am now i would like to call upon our chairpersons and speakers for the question answer session uh, our chairpersons and speakers please thank you dr vimi and uh, thank you dr neha for an excellent talk it was a pleasure to listen to you well we have received two questions one from dr rajara he wants to med uh, he wants to specifically inquire about the role of sevoflurane and or dasfurane for uh, you know hepatectomy and uh, uh, comment on donor risk index okay. hi good afternoon and uh, dr manish how are you my pleasure ma'am Okay, so to answer Dr. Raghu's question, uh, uh, like I said in my uh, lecture, uh, all inhalational anesthetic agents actually decrease the hepatic blood flow, but amongst them, the safest are uh, isoflurane and desflurane. These decrease the hepatic blood blood flow the least amongst all the inhalational agents. So both can be used safely. Sevoflurane has also been used safely in these patients. because it doesn't undergo too much of metabolism in the liver only 0.2% of it is gets metabolized so it doesn't cause hepatotoxicity uh, it is we as a routine only use isoflurane for these patients it we have found it to be safe uh, if the donor is slightly obese uh, then desflurane would be a reasonable choice because you want them to wake up on the table and uh, extubate the patient on the table so it would help in those kind of patients you know around 30 bmi uh, otherwise mm -hmm. both can be used safely not a problem and the other thing you wanted to know was about donor risk yeah, index like dr dheer already mentioned uh, yeah. dri is basically used for deceased uh, donor transplantation and not for a live donor transplantation and basically predicts the graft survival in the recipient 
so it's not relevant to live donor health. Live donors are generally the healthiest. We don't want to yeah. risk any of our donors with any exactly. kind of you know underlying comorbidities or risk factors which can increase their morbidity and mortality. So it doesn't apply here. I also have a question. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, and any specific strategy for you know for the fluid management and for maintaining the perfusion pressures? Like some people use low dose noradrenaline infusion to maintain the hemodynamics while they use lesser amount of fluids in the donor. Right, right. So invariably, whenever you reduce the central venous pressure, so it's like it's mentioned in the textbooks, less than uh, five millimeters of mercury. It actually doesn't. Um, I mean, it's not practically. It's not possible because if you keep it below five millimeters of mercury, the blood pressure really goes down, and you don't want to risk the perfusion of the vital organs, especially the kidney. So invariably, you need to start a low dose of norad in these patients. And what I have found is that if you keep the CVP between five to eight. You know, slightly above five, you know, it's a good balance between keeping the blood pressure all right. You don't risk hypoperfusion and you don't need to use very high doses of inotropes. So between six to eight is a reasonable. It doesn't increase the uh, bleeding at all. It doesn't increase the congestion of the liver. The surgeons are also happy. But like you rightly said, in many cases, when you keep the CEP low, you need to start a low dose of vasopressors, which is not actually, it uh, doesn't increase the risk in any way. And it and can be for Sorry. Sorry. And do you actually look at the urine output in the, you know, dissection phase? Because a lot of, you know, literature mentions about maintaining certain amount of urine output, but actually, you worry actually, about that? Uh, we, I don't look at the urine output at all because it doesn't truly reflect the renal perfusion. Mm -hmm. So if you are getting a good renal output, that's fair enough, but I am not risking increasing the fluid therapy just to maintain a certain uh, urine output. So that, that is my strategy. And I don't think it is really recommended also because urine output is, is not actually a true indicator of the intravascular status. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hi, Ashish, how are you? Hi, and thank you for such a nice presentation. Hi, Manish, and uh, hi. I have a, hi, Neha, I just have a small question for you. Yes, In your evaluatory setup, you talked about MELD. So any light on the LTRS, that is the liver transplant risk score, <clears throat> validity vis-a-vis -vis MELD, or are we looking towards using it? So we definitely look at the MELD to see what will, uh, what we, what kind of patients we have and what kind of complications, like it may, uh, it studies have found that a higher MELD actually leads to a worse prognosis in the post-transplant period and increased morbidity. So though we cannot do much, we are optimizing as, as much as possible, but we are not optimizing the men. So uh, we basically look into it just to see, get an idea about uh, what patient is it is and how we have to manage. But overall, since we cannot do much with the men, so we uh, look into it just for the prognosis purpose. So uh, the part two thing was that the... Uh... LTRS is for the 90-day mortality. So is the MELD correlating very well? with? Are we happy with the 90-day mortality or a one-year mortality? Or do we... Uh, Definitely, we are more concerned about the long-term mortality also than just with the short-term mortality. So I would not say that we are very much dependent on the MELD for uh, the mortality purpose. But yes, it is of some significance since we are looking into the MELD. Just a point to this, that the BMI more than 45 is now being taken up. So you mentioned it is an absolute contraindication. So that's, uh, but otherwise, thank you for your presentation. And uh, ma'am, if I'm allowed, just a small question. Sure, sure, Ashish. The donors, how's your uh, experience with the chronicity of pain in them? Just um, Actually, uh, we are not doing too much of uh, donor hepatectomies in our hospital. But from our, my previous experience in other center, uh, they do have significant, significant amount of pain. You know, at least 20 to 30 percent of these patients would come back into the follow up clinics complaining of pain. So, definitely, they do have a higher incidence of uh, chronic pain. And uh, I've seen patients who have received epidurals have lesser incidence of chronic pain. So, I would always suggest that we use a thoracic epidural whenever possible because not only does it take care of the acute pain, it also prevents chronic pain. So that was my experience from this last center that I worked in. 
So, Thank you so uh, much. And even for our hepatic resections where we put in uh, thoracic epidurals for all these patients, the incidence of chronic pain is very less in those patients, which is anyway mm -hmm. less compared to a donor hepatectomy. But yes, patients who have received uh, thoracic epidurals, the incidence of chronic pain is less. Can I make a comment, please, if it is possible? Sure, sir. Sure, sure. sure, sure. Good morning, just, sir. Uh, good, good afternoon. <laughs> good evening. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just want yeah, to uh, let me clarify or say that at the outset that I don't have much experience in uh, the liver transplant, but I was listening to the discussion on central venous pressure. Uh, as you mentioned that these are the fittest of the patients, so the pressure volume relationship of the right ventricle in these patients would be absolutely normal, which means that the CVP would have a very flat curve. The, the, the pressure volume relationship will have a very flat curve. It will be very difficult to increase this CVP because the ventricle is very compliant. So instead of looking at the absolute CVP, what I feel is that the, the other a confounding factor that would come into play in these patients would be the mean airway pressure. So it is only the mean airway pressure that will be able to increase the CVP rather than volume infusion because the uh, pressure volume relationship is absolutely flat. So I would suggest that you should look at the mean airway pressure and uh, uh, therefore look at the baseline CVP rather than the absolute CVP. So look at the CVP, baseline CVP after you initiate the positive pressure ventilation and let that be your uh, baseline CVP above which should be considered as abnormal and below which should be your aim. So if my baseline CVP is 10, then I would you know, strive to maintain a CVP of 7 or 8 and not less than 5. If my baseline CVP is uh, 6, then maybe I, can, I could try to lower it to less than 5. So you are absolutely right. In fact, some of the patients when we start uh, without giving any fluids, like you rightly said, some of them will have a higher CVP, to about, even up to 10, 12, you know. So decreasing that CVP becomes, you know, the surgeon keeps looking at the monitor and saying the CVP is too high. You know, no, tell him the airway that. pressure. So you tell him the mean airway pressure. If it is 20, then the, you have to subtract one third of that from the uh, uh, CVP that you are saying. Sir, the mean airway pressure is generally also normal in these patients because their respiratory system is normal. So it's not very high. The airway pressure is also not very high here. But for, I, for reasons which I am not able to explain, some of these patients will have a higher CVP. So like you rightly said, you do not try to bring a CVP of 12 to 5 millimeters of mercury. It's not going to work. So even though the surgeons keep telling you the CVP is very high, bring it down, bring it down. Uh, sometimes you have to just kind of, you know, meddle with the, yes, Manish, yes. Yeah, thank you, sir, for enlightening us. Uh, a quick uh, comment, madam, for use of colloids in the donor hepatectomy. Colloids. A comment on colloids? Colloids. Yeah. Uh, actually, actually, there is no role of colloids in um, donor hepatectomy, especially, especially because nowadays the blood loss is very less. So previously, when the blood loss was more, maybe nearing two liters, then maybe you could give colloids. Uh, hydroxyethyl starch was being used, and uh, it's not been seen with too much of, pro I mean, uh, complications. But now that the blood loss is less, and there, there is really no indication of using the colloid and artificial colloid. So we can do very well with this infusion of crystalloids and a balanced salt solution. Yeah. Thank you, madam. Okay. Thank you, madam. And thank you, uh, uh, Deepak sir, for uh, uh, you know clarifying us the difference between CEP and the early pressure. That was very enlightening. And thank you, Neha, for a nice talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Temple. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's begin with our next session. Chairpersons for our next session are Dr. Sanjeev Aneja sir and Dr. Shweta A. Singh ma'am. Dr. Sanjeev Aneja sir is presently working as senior consultant in anesthesia intensive care at Apollo Hospitals, New Delhi. His areas of interest are multi-organ transplant, pediatric anesthesia and intensive care. He has got many publications in national and international journals. 
Dr. Shweta A. Singh Ma'am is presently working as Director and Head Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care, Max CLPS, Max Super Specialty Hospital, Saket. Her areas of interest are liver critical care, liver and kidney transplant, pediatric anesthesia, advanced hemodynamic monitoring, and patient blood management. Ma'am has got three book chapters to her credit and more than 30 publications in indexed national and international journals. Ma'am has been instrumental in establishing the transplant program in Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences and Max Super Specialty Hospital, Saket. Our first speaker for the session is Dr. Lakshmi Kumar Ma'am, who's presently working as Professor and HOD, Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. Her areas of interest are liver and abdominal solid organ transplant, GI surgery, pediatric and neonatal anesthesia, and research and teaching. Ma'am has got three book chapters to her credit and more than 100 publications in national and international journals. I would now request Dr. Lakshmi Kumar Ma'am to give her talk on hemodynamic monitoring during liver transplantation. Ma'am, please. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My topic for presentation today is hemodynamic monitoring in liver transplant. And over the next 20 minutes, I'll try to cover what I believe should be part of hemodynamic monitoring in during liver transplantation. Okay. So I hope you can see my slides now. Hemodynamic monitoring in liver transplantation surgery. And this is the way I'm going to take forth my presentation. Starting from the very basic monitor, the CVP. Is there a rationale in maintaining a low CVP in a recipient hepatectomy? Arterial line, that's a backbone of most of our monitoring. Are the radial pressures accurate enough? What is the role of a pulmonary artery catheter today? Minimally invasive cardiac output monitors that are based on a pulse contour analysis. bioimpedance and TEE, is it really the monitor for the future? And then of course the conclusions. Right. So we will start from the very beginning, right? So uh, we have the central venous pressure monitor and this is something that has been taught to us right from our undergrad MBBS days. The A wave, the C wave and the V wave. This is all quite okay when you have a normal patient but what happens to the hemodynamics in a patient who is to undergo a transplant surgery? So you know the primary wave that I'm going to talk about, the A wave is due to atrial contraction. The C wave is an isovolumetric right ventricular contraction. And the B wave is actually the pushing of the tricuspid valve into the right atrium. So you really get visible pulsations. And it's not uncommon for us to encounter mean arterial pressures above 10 or 15 soon after you place a central venous catheter in a liver recipient. So, while we endorse the role of keeping a low central venous pressure in say a donor hepatectomy or any other hepatectomy, can we keep a same low CVP in transplant and what are the limitations to it? So in a normal liver or a liver with a tumor with the remaining hepatic architecture essentially normal, the post-hepatic sinusoidal resistance is low and allows a free forward flow of blood, hepatic venous blood, allowing a bloodless feel for the surgeon. Even in this, in a donor hepatectomy or other hepatectomy with a slight head up, we always are wary of the presence of appearance of air which is sucked in and a possible embolism. But what happens to a patient with cirrhosis? There's a complete distortion of the liver architecture. The post sinusoidal, the interspace of dissy between each acinus is actually filled with collagen due to the proliferation of the stellate cells, the lymphatic clearance which is supposed to happen doesn't happen contributing to ascites. There is a resistance to the forward flow of blood. So how much can you keep a CVP low and how reliable is a CVP value in a patient with over tricuspid regurgitation and bounding pressures? So most of us would not be comfortable unless you have a low melt patient, but let us see what the literature has to say. There are about six or seven studies and I've picked up what I believe were the most recent 
Feng et al. did a prospective randomized trial in patients. He included about 83 of them. Prehepatic, he said, was less than five. So it was only at the time of prehepatic. And he said it was related to a reduced transfusion rate and lower levels of enzymes and lactates. Although there was an increased, uh, a fall in mean arterial pressure and a need for increased inotropes. This Sivinsky study has been criticized because it is retrospective. It takes a high CVP group is essentially a sicker group, while the low CVP group had low MEL, low BMI, and a higher platelet count. And here they said it slowed down the decrease of ALT and bilirubin levels between days one and five. I thought the most reliable to us at this time was a study by Wang. This was prospective randomized parallel group study. And they said that they kept the CVP to less than 60% of the baseline value, although they have not specified the phase in which the CVP was lowered. Restricted fluid by adopting a Trendelenburg position and nitroglyceride and frusamide were used. And they have given that the results were encouraging in reducing the need for transfusion, lower incidence of pulmonary complications and early weaning from mechanical ventilation. The consensus I would believe today is that in patients with high MEL, with high CVP, you have an unreliable fluid status because the splanchnic vasculature is extremely dilated and is incapable of contracting to return into the systemic circulation. Kidneys are very vulnerable to perirenal ischemia and can very readily go into acute kidney injury. So restricting CVP should be used with caution. Now, going to the second backbone of the uh, um, hemodynamic monitoring during, arterial, uh, during liver transplant is the arterial blood pressure. Now, most of us would find that putting an arterial line in a liver recipient is quite easy. They're extremely vasodilated and warm and the pulses are bounding. So what is the, uh, the, the mechanism behind the measurement of the blood pressure? The mechanical impulses are trans are actually converted into electrical impulses which are, which are rep replicated on a screen. And the transducer contains a Wheatson bridge which actually balances four resistors. Right? So what do we interpret from an arterial line? The rate of rise or the slope of this curve indicates the force of contraction. Presence of the dichrotic notch on the downstroke is an indication of systemic vascular resistance. The area under the arterial line would be a measure of the stroke volume and indirectly the cardiac output. And this is what is being used in most minimally invasive cardiac output monitors today. So our question for a very long time was, were we compromising the accurate measurement of blood pressure by not putting a femoral and choosing a radial? And this was particularly so at reperfusion when I would believe most of you would see a, 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 a phenomenon like this. So you start off with radial pressures which almost come to the femoral pressures. But as time goes on, you notice that the radial pressures have fallen down substantially, while the femoral pressures are still in the issue. The medical diagnosis is a figure I would feel comfortable with. Keep a closer look. The mean arterial pressures are not that different. I think in this it says 53 versus 60. Nonetheless, it's not something that we get too alarmed about. So this I'm sure many of you have seen and we perhaps have looked into the data and found that we have an incidence of about 40% uh, initially but the incidence is actually coming down. So what were our results? This is unpublished data but this was our result. Mean arterial pressure but not the systolic arterial pressure has a very high uh, correlation throughout all points of surgery as well as during reperfusion. Right? So there is a point called the reperfusion point which coincides with the lowest recorded blood pressure and that showed a good agreement. So this is to say that if you were to measure a radial mean arterial pressure and use that as a guide, you're not too badly off if you don't put a femoral catheter during reperfusion in liver transplant surgery. Now, coming to our gold standard, the pulmonary artery catheter, anesthetists who began their career in transplant didn't start without this. So this is essentially invasive where you place a long 110 centimeter catheter through the internal jugular vein and position it actually beyond the right ventricle and into the pulmonary artery, where when you wedge the balloon, you would get an accurate correlate of the left atrial pressure. This is a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. 
So we all know that as you introduce it, this is a patient who's coagulopathic and if you don't put your line in, you could have a hematoma. Now as the catheter goes into the right ventricle and actually doesn't float up into the PA, there is usually a flurry of ventricular ectopics and ventricular tachycardia making us hold our breath in anxiety. There is also a reported morbidity, particularly in patients who have had a high pulmonary arterial pressure before. So what is its use today? Perhaps it's coming down. There is another uh, 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 criticism regarding its use in that when you use an intermittent thermodilution, the value of cardiac output out obtained varies depending upon the volume, the temperature of the injectate, as well as the timing in the respiratory cycle that it is injected. So this has been replaced by the continuous cardiac output thermodilution catheter where you actually have a thermodilution catheter with a thermofilament incorporated in it. And this emits pseudo-random signals every 30 to 60 seconds at the start of the thermofilament. And this is picked up distal or downstream in the PA. And this correlates to the cardiac output measurement, which is a thermodilution. So the current value is that a pulmonary artery catheter reflects pressures and not the volume. And CVP or a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is not reflective of a right ventricular or left ventricular end diastolic pressure. As I've mentioned in intermittent thermodilution, there is timing of the respiratory cycle and the volume and temperature. Whereas a continuous cardiac output using the thermofilament may take about three to six minute times during which there's major hemodynamic alteration. What would I use it in today? If a patient had significant varices or had a mild to moderate pulmonary artery hypertension, which is not a contraindication for surgery, perhaps I would consider in situations where a TEE is unavailable or is contraindicated as in large varices. So what do we commonly use today and what is the need to do hemodynamic monitoring? One needs to measure a pressure for the ventricles to pump against. So for the right ventricle, it's a pulmonary vascular resistance. And for the left, it's a systemic vascular resistance. You need to know the contractility of the myocardium, which is given by the stroke volume or the stroke volume index. And this has been incorporated without major invasive methods by a simple arterial line. This uses the principle of the heart-lung interaction during positive pressure ventilation, wherein there is an increase in the systolic pressure during inspiration and a fall during expiration. Now, the analogy is, if you had a well-filled venous system in the body, despite the variation between inspiration and expiration, the variation in the stroke volume and indirectly the cardiac output is usually minimal, less than 10%, as you would say, for the flow track vigilio. On the contrary, if the venous system were underfilled and collapsing, then you would find a higher variability or a stroke volume index, a stroke volume variation of about 80 and this, by the Frank Starling curve, is supposed to pick up the fluid responder who would come in this part of the Frank Starling curve. Right? So an appropriate fluid therapy would give adequate cardiac output without pushing the patient into a volume overload or an underfilling. The pulse pressure variation, this is available in some space labs monitors. You just need to have an arterial line. You don't even need the flow track or other technology. One would be able to get the pulse pressure variation, which again is a, a manifestation of fluid responsiveness of the patient. This is the calculation which you, the flow track uses. Stroke volume maximum minus stroke volume minimum divided by stroke volume mean. This principle is that the, the USP of this company, Edwards, in this flow track uh, technology, is that, that analyzes each arterial waveform so very rapidly at a particular frequency. Every 20 seconds, the stroke volume estimates are taken. And it looks at certain um, uh, uh, patents for that particular product, like skewness and kurtosis of the arterial curve. So you will get a stroke volume which gives you a cardiac output. You will get the stroke volume variation that gives you the fluid responsiveness and the systemic vascular resistance that derived variable mean arterial pressure minus central venous pressure divided by cardiac output into 80 will give you the systemic vascular resistance. So you just know whether you need to go up on your vasopressors or give more volume. Remember, this is a crude technology, albeit one that we have found very comfortable over several years. And this is a typical screen where you find a high cardiac output. This patient is adequately filled with a stroke volume variation, which is less than 2%. And 
you can see that the SVR is 530. An additional uh, um, benefit that it gives is VO2 DO2, that is oxygen delivered by the oxygen consumed. And you can be sure most, most patients, almost all patients under anesthesia, unless they would have some myocardial dysfunction, have a very high DO2 and therefore you never falter in the amount of oxygen that is delivered to the tissues during surgery. Now, if this was so good, why are we still talking further? This system is crude, as I have mentioned. It's completely dependent upon the integrity of the arterial trace. It is not reliable in a low heart rate to respiratory ratio. That is more ventilation as compared to the rate. In the presence of arrhythmias, what has been indicated are atrial arrhythmias. Now, this is patented with a tidal volume of 8 to 10 ml per kg. Whereas if you go down to this current uh, belief of 6 to 7, I'm not sure if the SVB is reliable. Again, in conditions of increased abdominal pressure and open thorax, of course, spontaneous breathing, the stroke volume variation becomes unreliable. Now, if you didn't know volume from this monitor, can we actually find out how much of water there is in the interstitial space and will that help our management? So this was the next step taken by the Edwards and this is the PICO technology which has been incorporated where they have combined both the central line. They have an 8.5 French central line through which the cold solution is injected and the change in temperature, this is a transpulmonary thermodilution the cold fluid is actually picked up by a thermistor which is located in the femoral artery. So as you can see, this is an invasive method and in a patient with coagulopathy, one would need to be cautious in insertion of a large femoral catheter. But what is its purported advantage? Besides the values that are given by the flow track vigilio, this surpasses it by giving a global ejection fraction, end diastolic index, and more importantly, the extravascular lung volume uh, extravascular lung water. So this would actually tell you about the occurrence of early pulmonary edema and therefore a need to slow down fluid administration in this subset of patients. Now, how does it compare with the conventional cardiac output measurement by the pulmonary artery catheter? This is a study that was published in 2018. Now, the authors have described it very elegantly, saying that the bias and the Standard deviation was comparable, but they have gone beyond the 35% or 33% that was described by Critchley and Critchley, which is what most of us who try to do studies on cardiac output measurement follow. So they have used saying up to 45 is acceptable. So the mean bias was about 0.35 with minus 2.3 to 3 liters of measurement. But when you look closer and look at this four quadrant plot, you'll find that a large amount of these values come in the center point, which cannot be taken for analysis. And they ideally, they need to trend in the same direction or the points come here and here, but they have come outside. And the authors have admitted that there is a trending variability, which means one may show high while the other may show low. Therefore, it leads a question as to which one are you going to follow for your patient. Now, this is a short influx of other monitors, essentially based upon the arterial contour-based cardiac output monitoring. The LITCO was very popular in UK and there were a lot of published articles. But by the time it came to us, we found that there was an integrated LITCO where you have the lithium that is incorporated on a card and this worked almost like a flow track monitor did not give us any additional advantage. A pressure recording analytical method is actually reported. This is an article from 2018 where the test was actually performed in anesthetized dogs. And they have surprisingly given a good correlation between the pulmonary artery catheter and this technique of measurement. However, it is as yet unavailable to us. So when you compare the various methods of pulse contour analysis, you find that the flow track, the reason for its popularity is that it's very simple. Minimally invasive, operator independent, does not need calibration. However, it is inaccurate, particularly in vasoplegic patients and may not track changes in stroke volume accurately. The PICO or the volume view that we've discussed appears to be very good in the sense it combines the, uh, the principle of the pulmonary artery catheter where it uses thermodilution. It also uses a femoral catheter. Therefore, it is more robust during hemodynamic changes. However, it is more invasive. And the cost in India, I would believe each set comes between 30,000, 35,000 to 40,000. So most of us would like to question its utility for a particular patient. 
perhaps it can be applied to some high risk groups. The LITCO I'm not discussing because the LITCO version available to us is not very useful. The PRAM or the pulse, the analytical method of the pulse is supposed to be good, but it needs more validation studies. What about impedance? Impedance is very popular. I think for surgeries, it's like neurosurgery or it's away from the chest. This may be of use. When you try to use impedance in any abdominal surgery, you find pottery interferes so very much with it, leaving poor reliability. And this is exactly the assessment that was done in a liver transplant surgery between you know, um, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the impedance cardiography in a liver transplant versus a standard pulmonary artery catheter. So what is the best amongst what we have? What is the past? What is the present? And what is the future? The swan guns we say is no, no longer should be used so aggressively. So what we have now is the minimally cardiac, uh, invasive cardiac output monitors where we have seen a lot of limitations. Are we, is the future going to be in trans esophageal echocardiography? Now, most of us have tried to make a beginning in trans esophageal echocardiography and the limitations essentially are availability the lack of technical expertise, you need to do about 100 or 150 per year to be really good in doing this, right? The availability of the monitor, the lack of expertise in interpretation and the presence of viruses. God forbid if you're, see, they say that the incidence of bleeding complications in a non-surgical patient with a TEE is about 0.17%. 0.27 in a cardiac surgical patient and it becomes at 0.47 to 2% in a liver transplant recipient. Now, if your first case is where to lie in this 0.47 to 2%, you're going to take a lot of courage to overcome that and have the approval of the surgeon before you proceed to using this. However, when you look at case reports, there has been a case report of an unexplained hypotension during a liver transplant surgery and a transesophageal echo picking up a completely hypokinetic um, uh, 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 my, myocardium and going on ECMO with a good outcome. So would we have been able to manage it with just the PAC or the non-invasive monitoring that we are relying upon today? There is another um, publication in 2016 where they talk of two patients. They had, now, now the other question is that in this particular two cases that have been discussed, they have used both the pulmonary artery catheter and the transesophageal echo. And by the way, of course, the patients were high male and they had a thrombotic tendency. But they have, in the first case, they say they saw the development of the a thrombus on the pulmonary artery catheter consistent with the hypotension that was occurring in the patient and actually could not salvage. Whereas in the second patient with the onset of, with the administration of heparin, they saw a resolution of a clot and the patient make an uneventful recovery. Now these kind of reports keeps us to think whether it's time that we moved ahead to a more invasive monitor and what do we actually do to get there. Now this is a, a, the statement of um, uh, the statement that I just showed you on uh, advancement uh, of, uh, of transplant anesthesia. And this paper was actually published in 2020. Um, uh, uh, I think one of my colleagues uh, in Olney Institute uh, was a co-author. He's now uh, in the US. Right. So what they have said is that the usefulness of TEE in liver transplant is unquested. So in the pre or the anhepatic, pre anhepatic phase, you would need it for line placement. In particular, you were planning to put lines for a possible venovenous bypass down in the surgery where you need to confirm the tip of the catheter. Fluid management by looking at the right ventricular volume and contractility can be more comfortably managed than the minimally invasive method. Patients who are undergoing liver transplant have a hyperdynamic circulation and there is an imminent possibility of the development of a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, particularly when you're using adrenergic agents. Here we have seen in the last two cases the possibility of development of an intracardiac thrombus. And most importantly, any kind of cardiomyopathy or a, a failing ventricle or a right ventricular overload at reperfusion where, or the development of a significant pulmonary artery hypertension, the, the di distinguishing between a vasoplegic and a hypovolemic shock. All these are probably much better interpreted with a TEE than it is with the current monitors that we used. So what's the catch? One, it needs to be available. 
Two, you probably need to position the probe at the start of the surgery. And for, to leave it safely for 10 to 12 hours, you need to confirm that there are no varices. So ideally, this patient should have had an endoscopy three to four weeks before and should have had banding if there are large varices. Patients who have varices that are grade three or above, perhaps are contraindicated for a TE unless they are banded and then an appropriate time accepted for um, um, uh, the surgery, which I'm not sure is possible. So you need an availability, the patient to be appropriately prepared, the use by a trained anesthesiologist, and of course the costs to be incorporated. But however, each time I give a lecture, I'm more and more convinced that this is probably the monitor of the future and things that we should be raising to acquire knowledge about. So to conclude, there is a need for a reliable and robust hemodynamic monitor in transplantation surgery. The use of the PAC is restricted to very few clinical situations. Commonly used cardiac monitors are not entirely reliable. Advanced cardiac output monitors that use extravascular lung water are expensive and invasive. TEE is emerging as the most reliable monitor during transplant surgery. Need for training to achieve expertise and reduce the risk for GI bleed. The, uh, the occurrence of the GI bleed is probably a limitation for its use, but perhaps it's something that should be overcome in the next five years or so. Thank you so much for patiently listening to me. Thank you, ma'am. With immense pleasure, I now invite our very respected Dr. Deepak Tempe, sir, former Dean and Professor of Excellence, Molana Azad Medical College and Associated Hospitals, New Delhi. Sir is presently working as visiting professor at Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences, New Delhi. I request sir to give his talk on role of transesophageal echocardiography in liver transplantation. Sir, please. Good evening, chairpersons, faculty, and uh, dear delegates. First of all, thanks to ISA National, especially Dr. Navin Malhotra and ILBS, especially Dr. Mahesh Aroda for having me for this very specialized CME on liver transplant anesthesia. Uh, let me share my slides first. Okay, so as you know, T has established itself in cardiac anesthesia practice, and it is also finding its way into other non-cardiac areas, especially liver transplant anesthesia. And uh, there are several views that have been described with, uh, with the use of TE, but I'm going to restrict only to some of the views which are very relevant for transplant anesthesia and are useful for the hemodynamic management of the patients. I also assume that uh, most of you are aware of the basic views of the uh, transesophageal echocardiography. If you are not, then maybe we'll need perhaps another lecture to talk about the basics of transesophageal echocardiography. But in this lecture, I will assume that most of you are familiar with uh, the views and the basic principles of transesophageal echo. I have nothing to declare. And as you know, liver transplant uh, patients, they frequently experience hemodynamic instability during surgery. And intraoperative cardiac arrest has been reported to occur in about 5.5% of the patients. And also intraoperative hypertension and blood pressure liability they are associated with increased mortality, craft failure, and ac acute kidney injury. So that's why the hemodynamic management becomes so important in patients undergoing liver transplant surgery. Now, as far as T during transplant is concerned, it can guide therapy in refractory cardiovascular abnormalities, a patient who is not responding to normal hemodynamic management. These are, those are the ones which can be especially benefited by a transesophageal echo. It can help you to assess the graft outflow in terms of its dimensions and the velocity profile that is hepatic vein. And it will also help you to uh, assess the inflow, that is the portal vein uh, flow pattern and the velocities. So these are fundamentally the important uses of uh, transesophageal echocardiography during liver transplant anesthesia. Now, majority of uh, transplant anesthesiologists believe that T provides uh, unique information However, it is used only in half of the patients. Why this disparity? Sorry. Sorry. What are the barriers? The number one barrier is inadequacy of TE training. 
The second is the availability of the equipment. And this is a chicken and egg situation because, because there is no tea training, there is no equipment available. And because there is no equipment, nobody goes for training. So this has to be broken, this chain and some of the equipment should be bought and there should be a diligent effort to acquire training and use it for the benefit of the patients. Also, there is reluctance on the part of anesthesiologists and the surgeons. Most of them believe, or many of them believe that so what is the need to have additional monitoring equipment? But in order to understand its utility and benefit, you need to really use it or at least visit a center where the T is being used during your transplant anesthesia program. So with this background, let me uh, refer to one of the publications that has happened in uh, last year. That's a focus T protocol for liver transplant published by, in the anesthesia, the cardiac anesthesia journal by Veneman and uh, co-workers. This is a retrospective analysis of 106 patients. So it gives you a limited information, but very useful information. And the authors tried to uh, check the TE protocol, the benefit of the TE protocol that would have helped them to detect five pre-specified causes of hypertension. And they found that the protocol detected 92% of pre-specified diagnosis and that it was useful. Uh, it led to management changes in 94% of these patients. So they concluded that a focused liver transplant TE protocol may diagnose pathology and guide management when standard monitors are insufficient. So which are the five pre-specified causes of hypertension in the author studies? First was hypovolemia, RV dysfunction, LV dysfunction, intracardiac thrombus, pulmonary embolism, and systolic anterior motion of the uh, mitral leaflet and the LV out outflow tract obstruction. Most of the anesthesiologists normally focus on volume therapy and the LV systolic dysfunction management by using inotropes. And most important inotropes or vasopressors commonly used during transplant are the uh, vasopressin, phenylephrine, and norepinephrine. But in situations where there is RV dysfunction or intracardiac thrombus or LV outflow tract obstruction, that therapy doesn't work. And for the diagnosis of these patients, transesophageal echocardiography is very important. So the authors studied these five views, four chamber view, long axis view, RV inflow of flow view, bicapal view, and hepatic vein view. Let me describe these views very briefly for the benefit of uh, those who do not know them. So that's the four chamber view, which shows the left atrium, the right atrium, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle. Note the RV is smaller than the LV normally. And that's the interventricular septum and the lateral wall of the uh, left, uh, left ventricle. So the authors use this view to assess the volume status and the contractility of the left ventricle. The next view that they used was the mid-esophageal long axis view. And because this view shows the left ventricular outflow tract, uh, very well and the aortic valve, they used it for the diagnosis of LV outflow tract obstruction. Now this view also shows you the volume status of the LV and the contractility of the anterior septal wall of the interventricular septum and the posterior inferior wall, inferior lateral wall of the left ventricle. So uh, this view is uh, the authors used for LV outflow tract obstruction. The next view that they used was the RV inflow outflow view, which shows the RV inflow, that is the tricuspid valve, and the outflow, that is the pulmonary uh, valve and the pulmonary artery. And this is the outflow of the right ventricle. This view shows you the RV, that's the RV free wall, and this view shows you uh, RV free wall contractility. It's an ex excellent view to assess the RV free wall contractility. In this patient, it is showing a normally contracting, contracting right ventricle. It can also be used to measure the TAPSA, that is the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion by dropping a M mode cursor on the lateral annulus of the tricuspid valve over here. So that's the next view that they used. Then they use the bicapal view, which shows the uh, superior vena cava, the interatrial septum, that's the fossa ovalis, where the patent foramen oval will be present. That's the left atrium and the right atrium. That's the PA catheter that has been used in this patient. This view also shows the IVC, which would be somewhere here. And by a little manipulation of the probe, you can uh, see the IVC also. In, in our view, in my view, this view, uh, this particular view is not very useful for the five reasons of hypertension that the authors have tried to use. At best, it can be used for detection of the PFO. 
the next view that the authors use was the hepatic vein view so this is obtained by inserting the probe into the stomach and turning it to the right so that you profile the inferior vena cava at about 90 degrees and then that's the hepatic vein opening into the uh, inferior vena cava so hepatic venous flow profile can be measured also the volume status with the pulsatility index and the size of the ivc indicates the volume status so in response to this paper, we wrote a letter saying that it, we prefer, we would rather replace the uh, bicameral view by the two chamber view because it, it, it gives you uh, uh, assessment of the left ventricular volume and contractility in another uh, section. So there's a transverse section or the anterior posterior section and the four chamber view uh, shows you the longitudinal section of the uh, LV. So uh, we believe that the second view or uh, pipeline assessment of the LV function would be more beneficial and the bicameral view can be eliminated. We also reiterated the utility of the hepatic vein view in this letter that we wrote uh, in response to this paper. Uh, so that's the two chamber view that we suggest. That's the uh, left atrial appendage, the left uh, atrium and the left ventricle. What you see here is the anterior wall now and that's the inferior wall. So, so that's another plane in which you interrogate the left ventricle in two chamber view. So now let us move to the cardiac involvement in liver disease. There are several ways in which you may have to deal with cardiovascular involvement in patients with liver disease. Number one is hepatic cardiomyopathy, which can manifest by way of either LV dysfunction, systolic or, or diastolic, and RV dysfunction. Next would be pulmonary hypertension or portopulmonary syndrome or associated cardiac disease, independent of the liver disease. So your patient may be suffering from coronary artery disease or valvular disease, which could be uh, present in patient who is undergoing liver transplant surgery. In addition, there could be a combination of any, uh, any of the above. So I'm going to focus on only the LV dysfunction part and not the rest of uh, the issues because of the shortage of the time and each one of them will require a lot of discussion. So this is a paper which was published uh, two years back, uh, talking about prediction of all-cause mortality after liver transplantation using LV systolic and diastolic function assessment. So why is the assessment of LV function important? This paper will throw some light on that. It shows that mortality is significantly increased more than twice if LV ejection fraction, that is a systolic function, is less than 60% or there is decreased transmital E by A ratio less than 0.9%, which indicates the diastolic dysfunction, or presence of both, that is systolic and diastolic dysfunction, by way of E by A ratio less than 0.9 and LV ejection fraction less than 60%, or if when the uh, diastolic dysfunction is present in isolation, that is E by E prime, E prime is the tissue Doppler velocity, I will explain this in one of the next few slides, E by E prime ratio is more than 11, which indicates the presence of diastolic dysfunction. There is a worse prognosis in this patient. So the assessment of LV function, both systolic and diastolic, is a great prognostic factor. And that is the reason why we need to monitor it. So this picture shows the, let's look at the LV systolic dysfunction. This uh, video shows the uh, transgastric mid papillary short axis view. Uh, excellent view to assess the volume status, the contractility, and the regional wall motion abnormalities. So this is a normally contracting ventricle. By eyeballing, I can say that ejection fraction is more than 60%, and that there are no regional wall motion abnormalities. So this patient does not require any intervention. Compared to that, if you look at this picture, you see the dilated LV with hypocontractile or hypokinetic ventricle, and the inferior or the, this the inferior lateral. Yeah, sorry, inferoceptal wall and the inferior wall is almost akinetic. So that is how the LV systolic dysfunction will manifest. Now, the reason the authors did not choose this view for the, in their study was uh, the fact that most of the times the surgeon is working in the abdomen and you are, it's difficult to get this particular view, which is transgastric view, because the probe has to be inside the stomach. And many times you are unable to see this view. But sometimes, as has been shown here, some of the times you can definitely obtain this view and assess the, especially during the uh, dissection phase and post reperfusion phase, it is very easy to get these views. Uh, this is the transgastic two chamber view, which shows the left atrium and left ventricle. That's the anterior wall of the ventricle and that's the inferior wall. Again, a good view to assess the left ventricular uh, function, systolic function. Next is the tissue Doppler, which is the velocity 
of the tissue is measured. Normally we measure the velocity of the blood, but here we measure the velocity of the tissue. And by using this technique, we narrow the sector and focus it onto the medial mitral annulus and measure the velocity profile. And it gives you three waves. One is systolic wave and the two diastolic waves. Systolic wave is S wave, diastolic wave is E prime, and uh, two, uh, two waves, E prime and A prime. So systolic wave velocity depicts the systolic function of the left ventricle. Normal velocity of more than 7.5 indicates a good global LV function. Less than 5.5 indicates LV failure. So it's a quick and very easy method of assessing the left ventricular systolic function. Moving to the diastolic function, you need to assess the mitral valve inflow velocity and the pulmonary venous flow velocity. So there are two ways on mitral valve inflow. One is the E or early wave filling of the left ventricle by E wave, which has got a higher velocity than the next wave, that is the atrial contraction. So E wave is more than A wave. The ratio is usually uh, more than one in these patients, normal patients. And the, in pulmonary venous flow velocity, you see the systolic wave and the diastolic wave and the atrial reversal, three waves. The systolic wave is usually bigger than the diastolic wave in normal pattern. In diastolic dysfunction, the deceleration time of the E wave, that is the time taken from the peak to the velocity to zero velocity, is increased to more than 160. And the E by A ratio is more than 1.5. And the pulmonary vein systolic uh, wave is uh, gets updated, as is shown in this uh, slide, you see that the e, e by A ratio is more than 1.5, the, the systolic optimization here, and there is a severe systolic optimization of the pulmonary venous flow velocity. But these measurements are load dependent, and therefore they are not as reliable as the tissue Doppler velocities are. As you can see that the diastolic, uh, there are two diastolic waves, one is E prime and A prime, and E prime will be, always be bigger than A prime in the absence of diastolic dysfunction. So whenever there is diastolic dysfunction, E prime gets obtended, becomes lesser than the A prime velocity. So that's a very easy and quick method of assessing the uh, LV diastolic dysfunction. And this paper has shown that if you measure the E wave, that's a mitral valve inflow velocity uh, against the E prime, that is the E prime velocity on tissue doctor. If this ratio is less than eight, then it's an impaired relaxation. If it is more than 13, it indicates a restrictive or a grade three diastolic dysfunction. So again, this is a very nice and quick method of assessing the severity of the diastolic dysfunction, that is the tissue Doppler velocities. Next, we move on to the RV dysfunction. And again, the uh, RV inflow outflow view is excellent here. You can see the RV free wall contractility and measurement of the tap set. Drop the M mode cursor, or cur cursor onto the lateral annulus of the tricuspid valve, and it um, measures the movement of the annulus towards the apex, as has been shown here, which is about 21 uh, millimeters. The normal is uh, 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 more than 16. And uh, as you know, that the annulus is pulled towards the apex when this. Uh, during systole. Whenever the ventricles contract, they pull the mitral as well as the tricuspid annulus towards the apex. So that movement indicates the systolic function of the uh, right ventricle here. So TAPSA is a measurement which can be obtained in this RV inflow outflow view. Then you can look at the four chamber view and look at the flattening of the septum here. Septum is normally a part of the left ventricle. So here you see that the RV is bigger than the LV and the septum is deviated towards the left side. So that again indicates the increased pressure in the RV and the RV dysfunction. In transgastric view, you can see the flattening of the interventricular septum as is shown here, that the septum is normally a part of the left ventricle, so that it should be concave towards the left ventricle in this manner. But here, because the RV is failing, it has pushed the septum towards the left side. So that is a classical D-shaped ventricle, left ventricle, that is described as a sign of the RV dysfunction in transgastric view. Now we move on to the hepatic vein view, which is very important in transplant uh, patients. Note the hepatic vein margins, which are very sharp and very, very clear, very clean margins that distinguishes it from the portal vein, which we'll see in the next slide. So hepatic venous flow profile, uh, this slide shows post-transplant. As you can see, here is the PTFE graft opacities on the IVC here with shadowing that indicates that this is a post-transplant uh, hepatic vein profile. Also, the, uh, uh, you can see the triphasic uh, waveform with systolic, diastolic, and the atrial reversal here of the 
hepatic vein. So that indicates a normal flow pattern of the hepatic vein after the transplant or the hepatic vein has been anastomosed to the native hepatic vein. Uh, Next is the portal vein assessment. Uh, Denault and colleagues from Canada, you know, described this method of assessing the portal vein uh, in patients. They were trying to study the RV dysfunction. They have done a lot of work on uh, RV dysfunction. And in an attempt to find out the portal vein uh, velocity pattern in RV dysfunction, they described this view. So you insert the probe into the stomach and direct it towards the right side and section in this manner the portal vein, which is here. So uh, you get this type of picture here and you see the Doppler flow velocity. Again, a monophasic waveform that you see with low velocity with very slight variation with respiration is observed. Whereas in RV dysfunction, you could get a pulsatile waveform in this fashion or even in portal hypertension, you may get uh, reduced velocities and the pulsatility may be present. So we will use this particular technique to assess the portal vein. So after obtaining the hepatic vein uh, uh, in this manner, this structure that you see with thick walls or the echo dense walls uh, is the portal vein, one of the tributaries of the portal vein. So at this stage, you need to insert the probe further, keep this uh, vein under the profile and, uh, and uh, increase the angle of the ultrasound beam to you know, obtain a longitudinal section. And this is how you start seeing the portal vein. And this is a normal portal vein flow, monophasic portal vein velocity that you can see. So this is how you should assess the portal vein velocity. And this is the pre-op portal vein flow velocity, monophasic portal vein flow velocity. And this is the post-op after the transplant the velocity pattern, which is again monophasic uh, uh, continuous flow waveform uh, with flow velocities, which are much smaller, less than 20 centimeters per second, uh, which are indicative of a normal flow pattern and good anastomosis in these patients. So there is one more picture of the portal vein here. That's the IVC. This is post-transplant. You can note the, again the echo dense walls of the portal vein here. And that's the Doppler profile, which shows the velocity in the portal vein. And that's the video, which shows the portal vein uh, here. And that's the IVC with again the that uh, PTFE graft, which is shadowing and thickened, uh, thickness that can be noticed here. And you see the portal vein, nice profile here, which indicates a good anastomosis in your patient. Finally, the uh, position statement by the SATA regarding the T in patients undergoing liver transplant surgery. The summary of this SATA statement is that more anesthesiologists are routinely using T during liver transplant. And as far as the effectiveness and safety is concerned, they suggest that T is as effective is an effective monitoring tool with a safety profile similar to that in the cardiac surgery. Regarding its utility or whether it makes a difference in the patient outcome that only time will prove if we do more trials and if we start using it more often, we'll understand the benefits and then we'll have more evidence in favor of the utility of the T in liver transplant surgery. So to conclude, T is a versatile tool during liver transplant surgery. It is useful for hemodynamic management. It is useful for assessment of inflow and outflow anastomosis uh, uh, post-transplant. And it can also be used for uh, hepatic vein artery flow profile after the anastomosis. But I do not have any pictures because I am I, I'm also learning how to obtain these pictures. And in next one of the next presentation, I should be able to show you the hepatic artery flow profile as well. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, sir. I would now request our respective chairpersons and speakers to begin with the question answer session. Our respected chairpersons and speakers, please. Uh, thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Tempe. Thanks, Lakshmi. It is always a pleasure listening to both of you. Both of you spoke very well. Very powerful topic and very powerful talk. Uh, let me go to the chat box and see what is their questions for you? Sanjeev, sir, sorry to interrupt. Can you please adjust your camera? It's not. Yeah, I'm trying to adjust. Okay. Fine, this is sir, the yeah. maximum I can do. Done, sir. That's good enough. And, uh, your TE probe. There's one question whether if we use the pediatric probe, it would increase safety. I do not agree to that, but let me put it to the expert, Dr. Deepak Tempe. I think they are worried about the esophageal varices. Yes, so you and the pediatric probe probably would 
be helpful. You may try it, but because there is no contact with the esophagus, the quality of pictures may not be adequate. That is one thing. Secondly, the length may be an issue. It, 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 the probe is uh, relatively shorter, so it may not. Uh, you may not be able to uh, absolutely reach the uh, deeper stuff. The deep transgastric views may be difficult. But in this, if you are desperate, and it's the class one indication of transesophageal ego, although there are no such uh, indications defined as yet but tomorrow if there is an indication class one indication for transesophageal echo during transplant one may try to use a, 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 a pediatric probe the, the key to the uh, problem is to be very gentle in manipulating the probe even while you are using the belt probe you should not maneuver it too much and an experienced anesthetologist is usually able to produce most of the views without much of anti-flexion Reflection of the probe. So the rotational movement and uh, insertion and withdrawal of the probe doesn't lead to much of a problem. It is the anti-flexion, retroflexion, or the lateral flexion of the tip that is likely to cause a problem in the patients. In any case, you should not use it in grade three. Try to uh, use it only in grade one and two varices. And unless indicated, you need to insert it in grade three varices. Okay, now my question is regarding transesophageal echocardiography. Uh, I am involved in the liver transplantation since its inception in India. And I tell you that there are two types of transplantation, whether we are dealing with the disease organ transplantation or the living donor transplantation. In the living donor transplantation, the hemodynamic instability is usually not found. You do not find many times uh, intractable vasoplegia. And then probably, you know, if we think that he is must to use in the living related transplantation, I fully agree probably that there should be availability and there should be know-how, but whether it should be used and it is helpful in all patients of living related transplantation, I, I, have, I have my doubt. You know, my doubt has increased probably, you know, it's all right for a high volume center like us or the high volume center others, but I have helped in starting low volume centers in many cities. And where I have found that, you know, the people playing with the tea, they think that tea in the living related transplantation is also very essential. If they do not provide TE, probably they are failing in providing the complete pre monitoring requirement. And that is not so. And in that, that data, they probably lose the basic fabric of monitoring. That is lost. But I want to say, you know, in the intractable hemodynamic changes, or the sudden cardiac arrest in living related transplantation is not there, is, is probably very less, and disease donor organ transplantation and the living related transplantations are two different things. The vasoplegia and the T would be more helpful in the patients of disease donor transplantation, not to that much in the living related transplantation. I would leave it open for Dr. Lakshmi, Dr. Tampe, Dr. Uh, Sweta to comment on it. As I mentioned, you know, the, the data is not there uh, and the data will come only when you use it. And uh, in medicine, as far as I think and believe that if the technology is available, it must be put to use. There was a time when nobody was willing to use ultrasound guided venous acid. Now everyone is willing to uh, do it. So if the technology is available, it is going to find its way eventually. You may delay it for a few years, no doubt. But eventually, it is going to find its way in, in your clinical practice. And data will come only when you use it. As I mentioned, that there is no data available as yet. Even the SATA statement says that, that uh, uh, the utility in terms of improvement, improvement in the patient outcome is not available so far. But that can only be available if you have uh, you, have, you create a data. And uh, Dr. Lakshmi mentioned a of, of few case reports, thanks to her because she mentioned, I didn't have time to mention those case reports, that you detect a venous a thrombus in the hepatic vein anastomosis. And what do you do? You would not know unless you had a T probe in, in C2, isn't it? So there is definitely an indication so regarding the difference between a cadaveric donor do uh, transplant versus a uh, uh, living donor transplant, I would not be able to comment because I do not have uh, that experience. I do not know whether the hemodynamics is different to start with in the disease donor transplant versus that of a living donor transplant. So those of you who are more used to uh, in the transplant business, they can answer this question. Whether the vasoplegia and the use of 
alpha stimulants or vasopressors that uh, Dr. Aneja talked about, whether it is true in terms of the living donor versus a disease donor. Yes, sir. Can I ask Thank a you, question? Uh, I Thank you, Dr. Kempe, sir, uh, for this excellent talk. It's my privilege to hear you. And uh, thank you, Aneja, sir, for asking me to comment on this. But I think that I agree with you that uh, in uh, when we are starting up a program, maybe we don't need uh, the transesophageal echo routinely with, with every case, especially in living donor. But then if we gradually use it, there are many cases in living donor where a lot of hemodynamic instability is expected and happens. And so having a T probe in addition, it really helps in management. So uh, gradually we have to use it. And the SATA paper, I think uh, Lakshmi ma'am would also agree, has clarified the situation quite a bit. It has told us which views to use, five views mid-esophageal, including a hepatic vein one, which helps detect the hepatic vein thrombus. Although I don't know how to make that view. But the others, they do help us in managing patients who are who develop hemodynamic instability, who we know are having global hypokinesia, the sick patients who are on ventilator sometimes when we take them up. It really helps to uh, have a TE probe in. And now we are getting more comfortable, more and more comfortable with routinely putting in a TE probe in those patients. We don't think twice about it. I have a question for Dr. Lakshmi if there is time. Uh, Ma'am, would you uh, comment on uh, we all the uh, which uh, modality for uh, cardiac output monitoring would you use in children in pediatric cases? Because we often have children around 10 kg, six to six to 12 right. kgs is very common, and we can't use. I mean, the uh -huh. is out, and uh, even we don't have the PICO, and we don't have our standard uh, Vigilio monitoring for that. We can't use flow track, so. Do you right. use anything no, routinely? I don't. There was a time when I did use a flow track and found it quite uh, not very useful at all. So uh, I think when I looked into the literature, they mentioned something about esophageal Doppler. And then perhaps if you have a pediatric uh, TEE probe, which again, it's availability, mastery over its use. Um, right now, uh, I, I, I don't use anything. I just go by the clinical uh, uh, monitoring. Oh. I, I Anija, sir, would you I, have you tried using icon? Have you because it's very minimally invasive. Once we are using, once we are not using anything, like ma'am said, we are not using anything, and we are getting all the pediatric cases done without any extra monitoring. It becomes difficult to. I mean, most of the cases will be done just like that. But we could develop a protocol of using something as non-invasive as, as uh, three or four uh, ECG electrodes, which are placed on the neck, and you can calculate the cardiac output, looking at the aortic outflow. Any comment on that? Have you used that? I have it. I am using mainly frequent taking sample from the central venous and seeing the oxygen, oxygen level at that to know the idea about the cardiac output. And Edward also provides something where you can do this online also. We are just taking the samples in between to see the cardiac output in babies less than 10 kg. I can see Dr. Achal here wants to comment on the... Dr. Dhir, please. Can you unmute yourself? It can Achal Dhir be allowed to unmute? Hello. Good morning here, everyone. Uh, it's so nice to see my friends, Dr. Tempe, Dr. Lakshmi, Shweta, Ashish, Dr. Aneja, uh, Gaurav, Dr. Aroda. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, if I may, I can just quickly comment. I really enjoyed both the lectures very much. Uh, and uh, as being a cardiac anesthesiologist as well as liver transplant anesthesiologist, I, I may tell my experience that uh, about uh, 20 years ago now, we moved from pulmonary artery catheter to transesophageal echo almost completely. It's only very rare on a specific situations like heart transplant, severe pulmonary hypertension that we insert pulmonary catheter. Otherwise, we all rely on transesophageal echo. As far as liver transplant is concerned, if it was not for the coagulopathy or the esophageal varices, the TE would have been the same as cardiac uh, 
uh, from the very beginning. It is only for these two reasons. So for about 10 years now, we have started using TE and we are reducing our use of pulmonary artery catheter. And if I were to pick one, I would use transesophageal echo. I'm almost sold on that, but yes, PAC has its own uh, utility. Uh, as far as uh, indications, it grade one indication of TEE is hemodynamic instability of any nature. And liver transplant is one situation where hemodynamic instability is the rule rather than exception. Whether it is uh, the living related or non living related, yes, if there is a low melt patient, living related, patient is stable, probably it will be available to us. We will not use it. However, the two things very important. One is the availability and number two is the, the knowledge of the person who is using it. It can be misleading if it is used inappropriately and in wrong hands. So I should uh, uh, kind of uh, warn people, those that just not putting the probe and taking some pictures, you have to know how to interpret these. I have a quick comment on Dr. Tempe's uh, question because I am still very reluctant in putting the probe in stomach. These are not the esophageal varices I'm concerned. It is the gastric varices, which are very difficult to control bleeding once they start bleeding. So if I have to use, I mainly use the mid esophageal views, but yes, my younger colleagues, they are more uh, kind of uh, cavalier and they do all the gastric views as well. So to get the hepatic venous flow, we have to be in the stomach. And number two, with the use of the retractors and the stomach being pushed uh, upwards. So it's sometimes very difficult to get the good gastric views. We try to get it once before the surgery starts uh, to take uh, all the views as recommended by the guidelines, uh, full views. But gastric views are difficult to obtain once the surgery starts. And it is easier said that yes, hepatic venous uh, flow patterns and uh, those things are good, but they may be practically not so uh, easy to obtain. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Etchel, we have stopped using the pulmonary artery catheter act completely, but we are only using it in patients where we know that we have photopulmonary hypertension. That's all. In liver transplant, I mean, that's all. In I all other cases... The... I agree with Dr. Dhe regarding the difficulty in transgastric views, but as a as an anesthetist, I am quick to use it whenever, as and when I can get the view, I try to get it. And uh, most of the times it may not be possible, but as you mentioned during the early phase, so you have the baseline, and after the reaper has taken place, there's ample time for you to you know look at on the anastomosis and get your transgastric views in a good manner. So when, while the surgeon is working in the abdomen, it's really difficult. <laughs> But you can, over a period of time, you can learn which are the time intervals when you should obtain these views and you should utilize those times. Don't go out for your coffee during that time. Be there and use that time for your getting your echo, echo pictures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. To begin with our next session, I would like to introduce our chairperson, Professor Mahesh Kumar Arora, Head Senior Professor, Department of Anesthesiology, ILBS New Delhi. His areas of interest include pediatric anesthesia, liver transplant anesthesia, post-operative pain management, 
He's had more than 100 publications in both national and international peer-reviewed journals of high impact factor. Our next chairperson is Dr. Achal B, Director, Liver Transplant Anesthesia, Associate Professor and Consultant Anesthesiologist, Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine at London Health Science Centre and Western University, London, Ontario. His areas of interest include liver transplant anesthesia, cardiac anesthesia, transesophageal echocardiography. He's had seven book chapters written, out of which five have been published and two are under publication, and has had several peer-reviewed journal editorials, review articles, publications, and abstracts. Our third chairperson is Dr. Dalim Kumar Bedir, Additional Professor, Department of Anesthesiology, Pain Medicine and Critical Care, Ames, New Delhi. His areas of interest include critical care, perioperative outcome research, airway. He has had 104 publications, out of which 892 citation and H index 19. His achievements include he is the Chief Thesis Supervisor of DM Critical Care Medicine and MD Anesthesiology. Reviewer of Journal of Clinical Anesthesiology, Indian Journal of Anesthesia, GOSCP. Now I would like to call upon our first speaker for this session, Dr. Govind Rangras, Assistant Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care, associated with the Institution of University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine, University of Chicago Transplant Institute. His areas of interest include liver transplant anesthesiology, regional anesthesia, and acute pain service. He has had numerous publications in the field of anesthesiology, GMA surgery, anesthesia and analgesia, British Journal of Anesthesia, Journal of Clinical Transplantation, and Annals of Surgical Oncology. Sir, now I would like to invite you to give your talk on the topic of Coagulation dynamics and management during liver transplantation. So, please. Hello, my name is Govind Rangras, and I will be speaking on coagulation derangements and management during liver transplantation. I just wanted to first start off by thanking Dr. Arora and Dr. Sindhwani for inviting me to give this talk to the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists. I am an assistant professor of anesthesia and critical care at University of Chicago, Pritzker School of Medicine, and uh, I'm a liver transplant anesthesiologist on faculty there. To start, I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to declare. I will begin by mentioning that this lecture is not meant to be an exhaustive review of coagulation and liver transplantation, and that this is a very highly complex topic littered with a fair bit of controversy. I will begin by providing a basic overview of the coagulation profile of liver transplant recipients and intend to then move on to highly topical areas of ongoing discussion in the liver transplant community with regards to coagulation management. I look forward to taking some of your questions during the discussion. Normal hemostasis requires a balance of two distinct opposing and highly regulated physiological processes, coagulation and fibrinolysis. By limiting clot formation and dissolving existing clots, fibrinolysis ensures vasculature patent patency after tissue injury-driven activation of coagulation. Hemostasis in patients presenting for liver transplantation varies considerably with the underlying disease. In many patients, hemostasis is characterized by end-stage liver failure with reduced synthesis capacity of coagulation factors, as well as anticoagulant and fibrinolysis pathway proteins. The result is a rebalanced status prone to both bleeding and thrombosis. Thus, interventions in hemostasis in this very special surgical setting may potentially increase mortality by either insufficient treatment of diffuse bleeding or over-treatment. Many coagulation derangements can occur during liver transplantation. Besides dilutional coagulopathy, 
trauma-induced coagulopathy and aggravation of pre-existing hypofibrinogenemia and a decrease of other coagulation factors due to consumption, thrombocytopenia, as well as hyperfibrinolysis and endogenous heparin effects can result in diffuse bleeding. There are many recipient, donor, and surgical factors that can affect the coagulation status of each of our patients. These patients often present to us with varying etiologies of cirrhosis, which can affect coagulation. For example, patients with cholestatic disease, such as primary biliary cirrhosis or primary sclerosing cholangitis, may be more hypercoagulable, as commonly seen on baseline viscoelastic testing. There are also differences in surgeon experience and their techniques and their consequences as to whether they use a piggyback anastomosis versus a full cross clamp of the IVC with vena venous bypass. Additionally, acidosis and hypothermia can worsen the bleeding potential in these patients. Here are some of the major coagulopathic changes that occur in patients with end stage renal disease, uh, end stage liver disease. As you know, in caring for these patients, patients with end-stage liver disease are at increased risk for both bleeding and clotting. Rather than tipping towards one or the other, it is now widely recognized that these patients are in what is described as a rebalanced coagulation state, with all components altered, yet somewhat in an equilibrium. For example, in terms of platelet dysfunction, these platelets, these patients, have both reduced platelet count and reduced platelet activation, yet simultaneously have increased von Willebrand's factor and decreased Adams T13, which cleaves von Willebrand's factor, which serves to increase platelet activation. Additionally, while many of the coagulation factors are decreased in cirrhosis, so are inhibitors of these factors, protein C, S, and antithrombin-3, for example. Please note that fibrinogen is typically decreased in severe cirrhosis, but may actually be normal to elevated in mild to moderate cirrhosis. In terms of fibrinolysis, many patients with ESLD are more likely to have hyperfibrinolysis, placing them at increased risk of bleeding, but simultaneously have decreased plasminogen and increased plasminogen activator inhibitor to counteract this fibrinolysis. We have come a long way from understanding coagulation from the days of the waterfall cascade model of the 1960s to the more sophisticated understanding of coagulation today. That includes our understanding of initiation, amplification, propagation, and fibrin formation. The waterfall cascade model, however, allows us to understand the basics and some of the potential pitfalls of the current coagulation testing as they pertain to liver transplant recipients for whom these tests have demonstrated limited utility because of the disruption in hemostatic balance that they just demonstrate. Clinically, we often see the consequences of these patients being at increased risk of both bleeding and thrombosis. We're becoming increasingly more aware of the consequences of cirrhotic patients being at increased risk of clotting and of particular concern are DVT, PE, portal vein thrombosis. The incidence of DVT in, in cirrhotic patients has been difficult to assess and has been reported anywhere from half a percent to over 6%. And what is important to recognize is that despite derangements in INR values, these patients are not auto-anticoagulated as once was assumed to be the case. One retrospective study found intraoperative incidence of pulmonary embolus to be 4% in a study of 495 patients at a single institution over a three-year period. The incidence of portal vein thrombus at the time of liver transplant has been reported to be as high as 17% in a multi-center study. The incidence of intracardiac thrombosis has been reported to also be as high as 6.25%. Both intracardiac thrombus and pulmonary embolus occur most frequently after graft reperfusion, and these are associated with extremely high mortality. 
However, it is important to note that thrombotic events may occur during all phases of liver transplant. In this University of Wisconsin retrospective study of 528 patients, the authors found the incidence of intracardiac thrombus to be 4.2% with a mortality of 45.5%. Patients who developed intracardiac thrombus had higher physiological model for end-stage liver disease scores at the time of transplant. They also received grafts from donors with a higher body mass index and had a longer intraoperative warm ischemia time. The odds of developing intracardiac thrombus were significantly lower after the administration of IV heparin prior to inferior vena cava clamping compared to the lack of administration of heparin. It is important to note here that the prevalence of intracardiac thrombus that was reported in this study was much higher than has been reported at other centers. This may be explained by their routine use of transesophageal echocardiography in OLT. This possibility underscores Dr. Deepak Tempe's excellent points on the use of TEE in OLT. During liver transplantation, both bleeding and thrombosis can be catastrophic. How can we best assess these patients' risk before and during liver transplantation and possibly predict which patients are at higher risk? Traditionally, we have relied on PTINR to assess coagulation status of these patients. In fact, INR is a component of the MELD scoring system, which affects patients standing on the liver transplant list in the United States. However, there are many issues with interpreting the INR in patients with liver disease, especially since it was not developed for testing the coagulation status in this patient population. In addition, the values may vary significantly for the same patient and there is significant inter-laboratory variability. There are a number of studies listed here for your reference that demonstrate the limitations in using INR as a predictive uh, uh, score and component of determining their coagulation status. The other option that is used now, has been used now for many years is viscoelastic testing with either the TEG or ROTEM systems. Overall, these two types of viscoelastic testing are fairly similar, similar, and I've used either one of these in different centers. Both, measuring, both measure clotting time, which is reported as the R or reaction time in TEG, and the CT or clotting time for ROTEM. Clot kinetics are then reported as the K or kinetics in the TEG, and the CFT or clot formation time in the ROTEM. Maximum strength of the clot by MA or maximum amplitude in TEG and MCF or maximum clot firmness in the ROTEM and clot lysis at a specific time is indicated by LY30 or LY60, which refer to 30 and 60 minutes respectively, or CLI30 or CLI60, which is referred to as the clot lysis index at 30 and 60 minutes. I have included these slides for your reference in, in case you would like to read more in depth about these tests and how they work. This is the information for the ROTEM, and this is the information for the TEG. I would like to discuss a little bit about the outcomes that we have now learned a little bit more about as a result of several single center studies with regards to the use of thromboelastometry in liver transplant. Single center studies, which are, have been all retrospective and have looked at 413 patients in one and 386 patients in another undergoing OLT, demonstrated the reduced transfusion of red blood cell and factor concentrates. These studies also did note, however, an increased fibrinogen use and as a result, various algorithms have been developed uh, to guide transfusion related to uh, the results of thromboelastometry used at different centers. 
it is important to note that there's wide institutional variability and transfusion practices in response to the TEG results. Can Rotem help predict which patients will have significant bleeding postoperatively? Well, in this study of 243 liver transplant recipients that obtained Rotem and conventional coagulation tests upon admission to the ICU and compared postoperative bleeding rates, uh, this study defined postoperative bleeding as three or more units of PRBCs or reoperation for non surgical bleeding within 48 hours after transplant. What they found was very interesting. They found that post-operative PT-PTT and the clotting time on the x tem in addition to the amplitude on the fib tem again, this center is using the ROTEM study. These studies that were obtained on admission to the ICU all differed significantly between the group of patients who experienced post-operative bleeding and those who did not. They argued that Rotem values were more valuable as they helped guide transfusion therapy. For example, an abnormal FibTem amplitude at 10 minutes value was significant despite there being no difference in fibrinogen levels between the two groups. This dovetails with what the earlier studies that were single center and retrospective studies found with regards to fibrinogen uh, 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 repletion by way of cryoprecipitate transfusion after obtaining TEG results. In a study performed at Pittsburgh, researchers looked at detecting hyperfibrinolysis using the Kowlin TEG and Rotem values at eight different time points during 37 consecutive liver transplants. These were obtained at induction, 60 minutes after skin incision, 10 and 45 minutes after portal vein clamp, 15 minutes before graft reperfusion, and at subsequent time intervals after graft reperfusion. Hyperfibrinolysis was confirmed by maximum lysis that was greater than 15% on the Rotem, or lysis at 30 minutes greater than 8% on the TEG, and normalization of maximum lysis on a simultaneously performed aptem that looked at fib uh, fibrinolysis on the rotem compared with the maximum lysis measured on the xtem. This table shows that 36% of the measurement, po measurement points, which were 89 out of the 250 measurements, demonstrated hyperfibrinolysis. The FIBTEM detected 94% of the cases, while XTEM detected 46%, and the Kaolin TEG detected only 23% of the cases. So this study showed that the ROTEM was superior to Kaolin TEG in detecting hyperfibrinolysis in patients undergoing liver transplantation. I would like to move on to discuss some of the key intraoperative strategies for coagulation management. Fresh frozen plasma contains both pro and anticoagulant factors, as well as pro and anti-fibrinolytic proteins. Many tra liver transplant centers use a fresh frozen plasma-based regimen. As a full disclaimer, the center I practice in is one of them. We know that risks associated with FFP transfusion are transmission of infectious diseases, trolley, and transfusion-associated cardiocirculatory overload. In addition, large volumes of FFP transfused in the intention to improve hemostasis are also likely to ad trigger additional RBC transfusions. This has been already demonstrated widely in cardiac surgery. And speaking personally uh, from experience, Treatment of hemostatic disturbances with coagulation factors has, in theory, some advantages in comparison to FFP transfusion. Coagulation factors can be given according to specific demand. They can be virus inactivated and are readily available as they are dissolved within a minute. Even huge amounts can be administered without the risk of volume overload. 
some of the barriers to the use of say fibrinogen complex concentrates is cost. At our institution, we are beginning to do cost analyses accounting for wasted cryoprecipitate that is sometimes ordered by some providers in advance and thawed just in case. The study mentioned on this slide is a German study that used a rotational, uh, uh, the basically the, the ROTEM guided hemostatic management with fibrinogen concentrates, prothrombin complex concentrates, platelet concentrates, and tranexamic acid without FFP usage. They determined that the effect on 30 day mortality uh, was, was not adversely affected by the use of fibrinogen concentrates and PCC. This brings me to, while uh, ROTEM can be you very useful in detecting hyperfibrinolysis, uh, there is also another, there's a study that came out of Toronto that was a large retrospective study uh, that demonstrated that TXA appears effective in reducing red blood cell transfusion requirements without increasing the risk of thromboembolic events across a wide variety of liver transplant recipients. These recipients included those patients who are at low risk of bleeding or at high risk of thromboembolic complications. These authors did not detect evidence of an increased risk of thrombotic complications with TX, TXA exposure. This is most certainly a major concern when administering antifibrinolytics, particularly to patients who are considered hypercoagulable. Given that reperfusion is a time often implicated in fibrinolysis, at our institution, we give aminocoproic acid empirically during the anhepatic phase, unless there has been minimal transfusion requirements and the patient has a hypercoagulable profile. In this case, where we are concerned about hypercoagulability, we make actually a strong case to heparinize patients prior to IVC clamping. This brings me to my final point on intraoperative strategies for coagulation management with regard to routine heparinization prior to IVC clamping. At the beginning of my talk, we spent a fair bit of time emphasizing how patients are not auto anticoagulated despite their coagulation derangements. These patients are I still have a high propensity for clotting and for thrombosis. And the consequences of an intracardiac thrombus can be extremely high with a very high mortality rate. I will put a disclaimer here that there are no prospective studies on this practice to date. Uh, and that many centers, uh, even based on the, uh, by going by the literature and at our own institution at University of Chicago are routinely uh, considering the use of IV heparin administration 30 to 50 units per kilogram prior to IVC clamping. Some of the benefits here uh, were extensively discussed with our surgical team. The benefits being the potentially decreased risk of clot at the site of the IVC clamp or at the site of stasis of blood, the decreased risk of intracardiac thrombus that was demonstrated in the Wisconsin study, concerns over uh, uh, hepatic artery thrombosis or pre existing uh, uh, VTE or DVTs that may suggest that this patient, that patients are at high risk of embolic events in the perioperative period. And also, uh, reviewing the literature, we found that there was weak evidence to suggest that bleeding risk is substantially increased with low dose heparin administration at this time. The concerns that surgeons would uh, considerably have with regards to administration of heparin, particularly during uh, an operation where bleeding is a major, major concern, um, uh, are, uh, these concerns may be addressed with discussions uh, pointing out that heparin administration is reversible with the administration of protamine. Our recommendation is to generally risk stratify our patients to understand whether or not they have a hypercoagulable profile 
and to proceed with IV heparin administration in these patients. I think this is a hot topic for, for uh, d debate and discussion, and uh, I look forward to hearing some feedback on this practice and whether or not this is something that, um, that, that other centers are considering uh, doing in order to decrease the risk of, um, of, of, of venous thromboembolic events in the perioperative period during uh, liver transplantation. In general, ROTEM and TEG-guided transfusion protocols lead to reduced transfusion. However, no survival benefit has yet been demonstrated. We must remain prepared for massive transfusion in all cases as we've yet to find reliable predictive metrics for catastrophic bleeding and or clotting in these patients. But we should remain mindful of the particular considerations related to the coagulopathy of liver disease and continue to be thoughtful in our approach to coagulation management in these patients. Thank you very much for, um, for allowing me to speak. I wanted to say again, thank you to uh, Dr. Gaurav Sanwani and Dr. Aurora. I wanted to uh, also express my gratitude to the liver transplant team at University of Chicago, which is led by uh, our world famous liver transplant surgeon, Dr. John Fung, um, who was the former chair of surgery at Cleveland Clinic and is now our director at, of the Transplant Institute and uh, does absolutely a prolific job of leading our team and uh, mentoring me along with many of the other anesthesiologists uh, on our team. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you and I look forward to taking your questions during the discussion period. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to call upon the second speaker for our session, Dr. Gaurav Sindhvani. Associate Professor, Department of Anesthesiology, ILBS, New Delhi. His areas of interest include TEE use in liver transplant, hemodynamic changes during liver transplantation, pediatric liver transplant, post-operative pain management. He's had 26 publications in both national and international peer-reviewed journals of high impact factor. He has successfully organized 8th Annual Transplant Anesthesia Conference 2019 as an organizing secretary. He has successfully performed transesophageal echocardiography in more than 100 liver transplant patients. Sir, I would like to call upon you to give your talk on the topic of liver recipient, our protocol and management. Sir, kindly begin with your talk, please. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Gaurav Sindhvani, Associate Professor, Department of Anesthesiology, ILBS. First of all, I would take this opportunity to thank Professor M.K. Aroda, sir, and Professor Deepak Tempe, sir, for giving me this opportunity. I'll be talking on liver transplant recipient, its management, and our protocol. So my talk will cover the history of liver transplantation patient, how to prepare these patients, anesthesia technique in these patients, different phases of liver transplantation, post reperfusion syndrome and its management, early extubation after liver transplantation. The history goes back to the 12th century when xenotransplantation of an elephant head was done by Lord Shiva onto a child Ganesha. Way back in ancient China, huge and induced anesthesia lasting for three days by extremely strong wine and he actually opened up the chest of two soldiers and after examining them, he exchanged their hearts and transplanted them. Although attempts at transplantation date back to ancient times, the impetus for modern liver transplantation started in 1955 when Welch reported on his efforts to transplant an auxiliary liver into the right paravertebral gutter of an immunosuppressed dog. Then in 1958, Francis Murray described the standard technique of orthotopic liver transplantation. First human liver transplantation was attempted by Thomas Stars in 1963, and the first recipient was a three-year-old child with biliary atresia. However, the first successful liver transplant was done in 1967. Between 1966 and 1973, Stars and his colleagues, they performed total 12 cases of xenotransplantation from chimpanzee to humans. 
with the increasing number of patients on the waiting list transplantation of partial liver graft from living donor was attempted to increase the donor pool for this purpose broad et al they established the technique of segmental living donor liver transplantation however the first successful living donor liver transplantation was done in 1989 by strong et al when they implanted a left lateral segment into a pediatric patient now coming to the pathophysiology of this patient chronic parenchymal inflammation and necrosis leads to the fibrosis of the liver parenchyma it actually disrupts the normal hepatic architecture and it increases the resistance to blood flow which results in portal hypertension and with portal hypertension they start developing collaterals and different shunts between the portal and the systemic shunt and when the gradient between the portal and the hepatic vein reaches 10 to 12 mm of mercury this patient starts having different complications such as ascites esophageal varices encephalopathy and the hepatorenal syndrome so when this patient pre present to us for the pre anesthetic evaluation for liver transplantation they may be having a different complications at the time of presentation so they may be having a esophageal varices or a rectal varices and it is very important to know the grading of these esophageal varices and it is also important to know any history of upper gi bleed or whether they have undergone any bending because it becomes a absolute contraindication to put in a te pro secondly they can have cirrhotic cardiomyopathy which can present as systolic and the diastolic dysfunction they may be having a uh, different types of arrhythmia or they may have different kinds of heart block at the time of presentation they may be having a refractory or the tense societies and anesthesia induction plan should be managed accordingly last but not least is the coagulation disorder it is very important to use point of care test to correct the coagulopathy in this patient and it is very important to correct their coagulopathy before putting up the lines they also can have hepatorenal syndrome or a hepatopulmonary syndrome liver transplant it is basically a team work and it consists of a multidisciplinary team which consists of a hepatologist anesthesiologist intensivist surgeon radiologist pathologist and a good nursing care is actually a key for a successful liver transplant now how do we prepare the operation theater when they reach the ot complex before they are shifted the theater room should be warmed to 24 degrees celsius and all bombing devices should be checked including rapid fluid infusion system devices and at least 6 to 8 infusion pumps should be mounted on a infusion stand and the availability of blood and blood component should be cross checked with the blood bank at least 10 unit of prbc 10 unit of ffp and cryo should be kept ready before starting the surgery emergency drug tray should be kept ready and different dilution of epinephrine should also be kept ready transesophageal echocardiography cardiac monitoring device and transducer should be checked and kept ready after the patient is shifted inside the operation theater an intravenous cannula is inserted in the operation theater it is usually a 14 or a 16 gauge cannula in the upper limb and after that all standard asa monitors are attached and the patient is induced using a rapid modified sequence induction because all the cld patient they are considered a full stomach as they have a slow gastric emptying time moreover they may be having a ascites at the time of presentation all other lines are inserted after the induction so what we follow at our center we put in a, a right we put in a 10 french big sheet in the right igv as well as we put in a 8.5 french four lumen central lumen catheter in the right igv we also secure two radial cannulas one in the right and one in the left artery one is for the monitoring and one is for the blood sampling monitoring and coagulation changes has already been covered in the previous lecture so i am not going into the details of these things so coming to the different phases of liver transplantation and its anesthetic implication liver transplantation has been divided into the three phases dissection phase anhepatic phase and the neohepatic phase dissection phase it starts with the it is the first phase of the surgery and as we can see here a inverted t shape incision is taken 
In this phase, the liver is mobilized from the surrounding structure and the hilar dissection is done and a loop is secured around the portal vein, hepatic artery and the common bile duct. After doing hilar dissection, surgeon goes back onto the back side of the liver and he ligates all the paracable collaterals and separates the IVC from the liver, as we can see here. So what are the anesthetic implications of this stage? There may be a massive bleeding, which can be due to the history of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, venous collaterals, prior abdominal surgery, or if it is a case of retransplant. Another implication of this stage is a drainage of ascites, which can result in the post circulatory dysfunction, which can further compromise the hemodynamic stability of this patient. Another implication is the intermittent lifting and, and the rotation of the liver, which can cause transient cable compression. This is a case report which we recently published. It was a case of cocoon abdomen, as we can see here, and there were dense adhesion in his abdomen. And this patient bled massively during the dissection phase. And we transfused almost 35 units of PRBCs to this patient, along with 15 units of cryo and 15 units of pepi. We were fortunate to extubate this patient on the post of day one and he got shifted from the ICU on post of day six. So coming to the volume management in these patients. So before going into the volume management, we should know what is the splanking steel phenomenon which happens in the cirrhotic patient. As I have told earlier about the pathophysiological changes in cirrhotic, these changes basically cause two major changes in these patients. Portal hypertension basically causes the pooling of blood in the splanking circulation which causes the central hypervolemia, which activates the RAS system, which causes the fluid and water retention, which results in the increase in the total blood volume of these patients. Cirrhotics have almost 38% of their total blood volume in the abdomen when compared to the healthy patients who just have less than 30% of the blood volume in their abdomen. Secondly, they can have blunted response to the fluid loading. These are the diagrams. Uh, this is a diagram shown for a healthy patient and this is for a cirrhotic patient. When a fluid of 500 ml bolus is given to a healthy patient, there is a systemic rise of pressure of 5 mm of mercury. But when the same fluid of 500 ml is given in cirrhotic patient, there is no rise in the systemic pressure. This is because the cirrhotic patients have a very high venous compliance and whatever fluid we are giving, it is just staying in the venous compartment. And this is also a reason why in many studies, mini fluid challenge of 150 ml has not found to be effective for the child B and C category, while for child A, they have found it to be effective. So the traditional approach of volume loading in the section phase is not at all recommended because the volume loading, will load, it will lead to the splanking congestion and the portal hyperemia, which ultimately cause an increased blood loss. So how do we give flu to these patients? There are two approaches which have been suggested for the management of fluid in this patient. One is the fluid restriction and the other one is the use of the high vasopressor. In the first approach, central and the volume reduction is done by, by doing fluid restriction or by doing phlebotomy and their hemodynamics are maintained with the vasopressor and we target a low CUP in this patient and after reperfusion, the refilling is done. While in the second approach, high dose of splanking vasoconstrictors such as vasopressin is given, which shifts the blood from the splanking circulation to the systemic circulation, and eubulimia is maintained in these patients. CVP in the dissection phase, so what is its ideal value? Which strategy should we follow to lower CVP in this patient? And what is the safety of restricted volume therapy in these patients? Coming to ideal CVP, as of now, there is no consolidated evidence on the absolute value of CVP which should be kept during the dissection phase of patients undergoing the liver transplantation. However, few studies they have recommended or they have used a value of less than 5 mm of mercury or less than 40% of the baseline value. Ideal CVP is not known. This is a study uh, in which they have tried to know the effects of low CVP during pre anipatic phase on blood loss and liver and renal function in liver transplantation. And they found that the low CVP technique during the pre hepatic phase, it reduced the intraoperative blood loss, had a better liver function, and it 
did not have any detrimental effects on the renal function. This is another study on the low CVP effect on post-op pulmonary complication in patient front of the liver transplantation. And they also found a decreased number of post operative complication in patients with a low CVP group. This is a study where they have compared the restricted fluid approach with the liberal fluid approach. In restricted, they have given a fluid at 5 ml per kg per hour, while in liberal, they have given it a normal saline at 10 ml per kg per hour. And they found decreased number of pub, decreased number of pulmonary complications in the restricted group. And they have also recommended to use restricted fluid approach. This is a review on restricted fluid management, and they have also found no association between AKI and the restricted fluid approach. So coming to the choice of vasopressor during a dissection phase of patient undergoing the liver transplantation. Before that, we should know that the splanking and the systemic circulation in these patients. They crosstalk with each other. With the increase in intrahepatic vascular resistance, there is a decrease in blood flow from the splanking to the systemic circulation, while vice versa happens with the decrease in the intrahepatic vascular resistance. So, coming to its effect, the portal vein, preportal vein, and the intrahepatic vein has alpha receptors, while the hepatic vein and hepatic artery have both alpha and the beta receptors. In cirrhotic, the effect of vasopressor, it depends upon the type of receptor it acts, volume of blood in the splanking circulation, and the presence of portal systemic shunt. Phenylephrine is a pure alpha agonist, and it might not be able to generate a gradient between the splanking and the systemic circulation. On the other hand, epinephrine is a both alpha and the beta stimulant, and it might create a good gradient between the splanking and the systemic circulation resulting in shifting of blood from the splanking to systemic circulation. Other very important point in the cirrhotic is that they have a high intrahepatic vascular resistance. So for the vasopressor to act, for the vasopressor to act, they should have a portal systemic shunt also. Only then they will be able to shift the blood from the splanking to the systemic circulation. This is a study we have uh, done on, on the vasopressin use in patients undergoing liver transplantation, and they found that the use of vasopressin at 3.8 units per hour decreased the portal vein pressure as well as the portal vein flow. This is a study in which two different doses of vasopressin were administered, 2.4 unit and the 4.8 unit per hour, and they found that the vasopressin in high doses was able to shift the blood from the splanking to the center circulation, and it was the higher dose which increased the CVP and the cardiac output. Coming to the intraoperative cell saver, cell saver device can be used after the evacuation of ascites and before biliary anastomosis. There are conflicting evidence on its use. The advantages of using cell saver are reduces is that it reduces the need for allergenic blood transfusion, it reduces hospital stay, reduces the rate of surgical infection. It may be of paramount importance in the Jehovah's patient undergoing the liver transplantation. While its disadvantages are renal injury, salvage blood syndrome, which can be due to the activation of the coagulation cascade syndrome. There is also a theoretical disadvantage of transmitting a bacterial infection from the surgical site into the systemic blood. Therefore, some authors have recommended not to use a cell saver in a patient where the bile leak is present in the surgical field. For oncological patients, it is now recommended to use cell saver with the leukocyte depleting factor and to irradiate the blood before transferring it back to the patient. Coming to the anapatic phase, this phase begins with the occlusion of the portal vein and it is followed by the recipient hepatectomy. This diagram is showing how a cadaveric transplant anastomosis were done. This is a cadaveric graft and this is a recipient intravena cava. As we can see here that the cadaveric graft cava has totally replaced the recipient cava. And what we follow at our center is we suture both the ends of the graft cava and we do side to side anastomosis between the two cavas. As we can see here, side to side anastomosis between the two cava has been done. Living donor liver transplantation, it's a, a different entity. In this, we retrieve either a right lobe or the left lobe from the graft, and the graft benching is done. As we can see here, this is a right lobe graft, and the different veins of the right lobe graft can be seen. This is a vein of the segment 5, segment 8, and this is the right hepatic vein. 
all these veins are joined to the PTFE graft and a common outlet is formed. This common outlet is then anastomosed to the right hepatic vein stem. As we can see here, this is a piggyback technique. The IVC, the side clamping of the IVC is done. So anhepatic phase is the most challenging phase for an anesthetic. Various hemodynamic instability can happen during this stage, during this phase. With IVC clamping, there may be a decrease of more than 50% in the venous return. So for the patient who does not tolerate the total IVC clamping, you know, you know, bypass can be used. So what are the advantages? Uh, advantages are the better hemodynamic stability, prevents hypothermia, prevents renal injury, decreased intestinal edema. While its disadvantages are clot formation, thromboembolism, bleeding, and increased operative time. This is the editorial uh, on the whether we should use the veno veno bypass during the liver transplantation. And they have recommended that veno veno bypass pump should not be used if we are using a piggyback technique. Or they have also concluded that if a patient has a normal preoperative renal function, then veno veno bypass, then there is no need to use a veno veno bypass. Then coming to the neohepatic phase, it begins with the reperfusion of the grafted liver by sequential unclamping of the hepatic vein and the portal vein. As soon as the portal vein unclamping is done, blood, flow, blood from the splanchnic circulation goes into the liver, then it enters the center circulation, and then it enters the right side of the circulation, and the right side of the heart is exposed to the acidotic, cold, and the hyperkalemic blood which results in the hemodynamic instability. This is a diagram showing the, how the ischemia reperfusion injury can happen during a liver transplantation or during the reperfusion phase. With portal vein clamping, there is a portal hypertension and the splenic congestion. This along with the reactive oxygen species and the apotoxy and the necrosis, it causes the intestinal mucosal injury which results in the gut barrier failure. It prevents the which prevents the translocation. So after the injury, the bacteria and endotoxin, they get translocated to the systemic circulation. post reperfusion syndrome, Agarwal have defined post reperfusion syndrome as a fall in mean arterial pressure of more than 30% for more than one minute within five minutes of the reperfusion. He may define mild PRS as a fall in BP of less than 30% for less than five minutes and which respond to the injection of calcium chloride or epinephrine, while the significant PRS is defined as a fall of MAP or a heart rate of more than 30% with significant arrhythmia or asystole, or if there is a requirement of continuous infusion of final drop to maintain the hemodynamic stability. So how, do, how can we prevent the PRS in this patient? Hyperkalemia, which happens immediately after the unclamping of the portal vein, so they have recommended to use one to two units of insulin with each unit of PRVC. They have also recommended to give PMTB injection calcium gluconate just before the reperfusion. Aggressive correction with the sodium bicarbonate uh, is questionable for acidosis because now there is a good amount of evidence which suggests that the moderate to severe acidosis is actually protective for the patient because there is a right side shifting of the oxygen curve which actually increases the oxygen delivery to the patient during acidosis. And moreover, with uh, sodium bicarbonate, there are unpredictable increase in the sodium concentration. There may be a worsening of injury to ischemic cells in oxygen-rich environment, or there may be a pH paradox phenomenon. It has been found that the hypoxic cell, they recover well in an acidotic environment and this phenomenon, they have termed it as pH paradox phenomenon. And the mechanism which is responsible for pH paradox uh, phenomenon is the MPTP channels. Actually, these channels, they are closed in the acidotic environment and they get opened up in the normal pH environment. So in the acidotic environment, they get closed and they prevent the cell swelling and the cell death. That is why they have proposed that a acidotic environment is good for the hypoxic cell. In this study, they have found that the patients who had a pH of less than 7.32 before the reperfusion, they had a faster recovery of MAP after the reperfusion when compared to the patient who had a normal pH. 
and they have attributed their finding to the pH paradox phenomena. About the use of vasopressor for the prevention of PRS, they have recommended that norepinephrine and epinephrine, they are better than dopamine or the phenylephrine. In this study, they have found that the preemptive doses of 10 microgram of epinephrine and 100 microgram of phenylephrine have significantly decreased the incidence of PRS in this patient. In this study, they have given atropine preemptively to these patients and they have found a significant improvement in the heart rate during PRS, but there was no difference in the MAP during PRS. So coming to the extubation of these patients, the extubation criteria are same as for the other patients undergoing other surgeries. The patient has to be awake, hemodynamically stable, normothermic, normoxic, with good urine output. In addition, this patient should have an adequately functioning graft with normal Doppler. Early extubation, it refers to the extubation within one hour of the surgery. However, in liver transplant, some have defined it as a extubation within three hours of completing the surgery. This is a chart showing a different studies done on the fast tracking or immediate on table extubation for the patients. And they have found the incidence of reintubation ranging from 2 to 30%. And they have found that the most common reason for the reintubation was the surgical cause or the resurgeries. However, in one study, they have found the pulmonary complication as the most common cause for reintubation happening in these patients. This is another study where, where they have proposed a criteria to be considered for patient for fast tracking after leaving donor liver transplantation. This is a criteria they have suggested to be followed for doing fast tracking. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to call upon our third speaker for this session, Dr. Lalit Sehgal, HOD, Journal and Liver Transplant Anesthesia and Liver Critical Care, Manipal Hospital, Dwarka, New Delhi. His areas of interest include liver transplant, GI and hepatobiliary anesthesia, liver critical care, advanced airway management, advanced hemodynamic monitoring, renal replacement therapy in ICU, acute pain service. He's had numerous publications in national and international journals. He has played a key role in establishing successful liver transplant programs at ILBS New Delhi, Fortis Hospital Noida, Uttar Pradesh, Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Hospital New Delhi, and Manipal Hospital Dwarka New Delhi. Sir, I would like to invite upon you to give your talk on the topic of post-operative care after liver transplantation. Good afternoon to all. I, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizing team ILBS, ISA, and Indian College of Anesthesia for inviting me to dis deliver this talk. So as we have would have learned by now that uh, many sick patients with multiple comorbidities are being accepted as the transplant uh, candidates so the, the, the lot of ownership now also lies uh, in the for the critical care management to ensure a smooth recovery of the graft in the patient and also preventing the systemic complications with that. So majority of the crit initial critical care uh, is uh, a continuation of uh, the care in the operation theater. And we are the same team. Uh, doing the anesthesia as well as critical care, it becomes quite a transition for us, but it involves uh, and it involves uh, stabilizing the major organ system, evaluating graft function, and monitoring uh, and treating the complication directly and directly, indirectly related to the transplant. So, uh, this will be the further outline of my talk, which covers uh, primarily various organ system being affected or in. Uh, various uh, aspects of the care involved for the operative smooth recovery of transplant care. Majority of the patient develop hemodynamic disturbances during surgery, which continues post-operatively. So the ownership lies on us to optimize the liver hemodynamics and prevention of anastasis. It requires frequent evaluation for fluid management, electrolyte status, kidney function, 
The problem could lie both ways. It could be subclinical hypovolemia or excessive cardiac filling. So there, there is the challenge. And many of these patients have uh, subclinical pulmonary edema during the first week because of volume overload. When we consider fluid replacement, or if we give fluid generously, it could cause volume overload compromise the oxygenation, it could further reverse on the graft congestion and edema caused by ischemia reperfusion injury. And they all enhance the post-operative volume. Hemodynamic uh, instability could be because of various factors, or it could be ongoing bleeding, fluid imbalance, vasodilation, metabolic disturbances, and pre-existing relative cardiomyopathy, a myocardial dysfunction, which happens during the ischemia, uh, during the reperfusion phase. And we should not rule out the potential for coronary artery disease as many chronic liver disease patients are prone to develop that. So we have to ensure continuous hemodynamic monitoring to ensure adequate perfusion of the tissues and the vital organs. Along with the blood pressure and central venous pressure, we could monitor perfusion with left hand monitoring, left and heart, right heart filling pressures, cardiac output, urine output, monitoring the blood gases and the sequential hemoglobin level. While coming to the basic part of hemodynamic management, the aim is to optimize preload and afterload to ensure uh, adequate oxygen delivery to the graft and the other tissues. When we consider volume resuscitation, it should be uh, with the uh, goal directed therapy strategy. Target hemoglobin around 8 to 10 gram percent has been considered adequate to ensure optimal of, uh, oxygen delivery to the new graph. Hence, we have to monitor the serial hematocrits and transfuse accordingly. Along with that, these patients are prone to bleeding, uh, so we have to um, ensure our other product transfusion accordingly. We have to keep a low threshold for giving inotropes and vasopressors if it, they are uh, necessary. As I had discussed earlier, that we, are, they, we have to create a tricky balance of uh, underload uh, filling and overloading. So we have to target CVP between 6 to 10 to minimize or increase hepatic vein pressure and sinusoidal congestion. Generally, crystalloids are considered food solutes of choice. If necessary, they should be given with albumin. It has been seen transfusions more than 100 ml per kilo or a negative fluid balance of uh, 14, uh, less than 14 ml per kilo during the first post-operative days results in prolonged mechanical ventilation, extubation, time, and prolonged ICU stay. While we are talking about hypertension, hypertension is also common and many patients start presenting with hypertension in the initial post-operative period itself. And we have to treat proact uh, the hypertension proactively. If we feel that patient is overfilled, we have to uh, use diuretics, remove the excess. Majority of the patients are being ventilated in the initial post-operative period. Hence, now, uh, we have to support the patient till the patient is awake and out alert. It is able to follow with commands and protect the airway. And once we are sure of the patient can maintain adequate oxygenation and ventilation without the ventilator support. On one side, uh, ventilation support uh, can uh, lead to in increase in transmissive pressure, which can reduce venous return. However, it has not been found uh, uh, to be clinically significant. Along with the, that, the patients are prone to develop infections and non-infectious pulmonary complications in up to 70%. As these patients require a lot of blood products many times, so they are prone to develop transfusion with acute lung injury. So uh, it is recommended to stop sedation early and uh, extubation, earliest extubation should be planned. Uh, so it has, early extubation has not been seen associated with any hazards or adverse events. In fact, uh, the patient, majority of patients maintain satisfactory gas exchange and incidence of reintubation has not been found to be included. But this has to be supplemented with intensive rehabilitation program like parometry, just physiotherapy and mobilization of patients. There could be various factors which lead, could lead to prolongation of ventilator support. Few of them could 
are encephalopathy, hypoxemia, hemodynamic disturbances, severe obesity, primary graft dysfunction, uh, pulmonary abdominal distension, hepatopulmonary syndrome, pneumonia. So as these patients are prone to develop BD and coagulopathy, this, this is of impo important aspect of the care in the post-operative period. So <clears throat> the platelet counts, it has been seen, they decrease in the first week and uh, recover during the second week. It happens because of the sequestration of platelets in the liver and the spleen for, uh, due to preservation injury or hyperspinism. The mostly platelet counts start recovering by the end of first week uh, once the liver has shown recovery. There could be various causes of coagulopathy in post-transplant recipient, which is poor graft function, perfect hemorrhage, Faces, slippage of a tie, hyperspinism, hypocalcemia, dilational coagulopathy, and infection. However, we have, when considering correction, we have to weigh the risk of bleeding against the risk of hepatic artery and portal vein thrombosis. As these could lead to, uh, if they develop, these could lead to a permanent graft. Hence, we have to avoid overcorrection um, of coagulopathy with FFP or platelets. And these patients are prone to develop a lot of metabolic uh, perturbations, which includes hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, ionized hypokalcemia. And once the river starts re regenerating, they also are prone to develop hypophosphatemia. We have to ensure uh, <coughs> no normal electrolyte uh, balance by various measures. Along with that, uh, many of these patients have preoperative hyponatremia. And while we have to ensure during surgery as well as in the post-operative period that it does not rise rapidly because it makes the patient prone to dependent condyne myelinosis, which is practically unrecoverable. Many of these patients develop glucose intolerance and show a tendency towards hyperglycemia even if they are not diabetic. And many of them, because of the effect of the uh, corticosteroids or calcineurin, uh, inhibitors actually uh, and eventually become diabetic in the long run. So in it, if the patient uh, develops hypoglycemia, glycemia, it is better managed with uh, short-acting intravenous insulin, which is so hypoglycemia is an ominous sign, which uh, generally does happen when there is a graft dysfunction. Lactate levels show an important trend pre-operative pulmonary hepatic failure, necrosis, intraoperative uh, period because of high vasopressors, hypotension, and hepatic phase, they develop high lactate levels. It is a sign of uh, appropriate graft recovery. Uh, in fact, uh, so they generally trend towards normalization after transplantation during first uh, couple of days. Elevated lactate levels may be seen in hypoperfusion states, sepsis, or primary non-function. Kidneys are the organ which bears a major brunt uh, during the transplant. So there is some degree of kidney dysfunction. Exact incidence is not known. It could vary between 5 to 50 percent, and many uh, thoughts say that uh, it can actually impact all the liver recipients about 8 to 17 percent of male group require kidney So uh, among the various causes for the patients developing renal function could be because of preoperative hepatorenal syndrome or acute tubular necrosis, intraoperative or postoperative hemodynamic disturbances, acid transfusion. It could be due to long IVC clamping uh, and leading to renal congestion during the anosmosis phase. It could be because of intra-abdominal hypertension. It, in the sec, uh, earlier phase, once calcineurin uh, inhibitors are introduced, it could be because of the drug toxicity, or this could be because of the pre-existing kidney disease. 
the generally the kidney dysfunction which occurs usually improves post transplant so called renal protective agents like dopamine or other calcium channel blockers or any post transplants have shown no value in prevention or treatment however it will be it is recommended that reducing the dosage of calcium inhibitors like the chromis or cyclosporine or delaying their introduction does help consider we have to consider alternative uh, immunosuppressive agents and some patients may require renal transplant later if they develop a uh, Uh, renal dysfunction neurological complications are the ones which could lead to uh prolongation of icu stay it can vary between 8 to 47% encephalopathy is most common seizures are the second most common and in the first week because of the coagulopathy uh, uh, patient are prone to develop intracranial hemorrhage as many of the transplant recipients have uh, malnutrition that is up to 50% and malnutrition is associated with high morbidity uh, like increasing in post operative infections respiratory complication or icu stay central nutrition should be instituted promptly whenever it is possible in fact uh, it would be recommended if patients are severely malnourished and patients oral intake is not adequate to uh, start tube feeding as soon as possible if we cannot feed the patient enterally we should initiate total parental nutrition infections are the other reason which can uh, adversely impact so we have to be very proactive preventing the infection and, and uh, so uh, doing active surveillance in its in fact sepsis is a major cause of early mortality it, it could develop because of line infection uditis infective ascites cholangitis pneumonia biliary and asthmatic in, uh, it has been seen prolonged and complicated surgical procedure and the volume of blood was directly correlated with the risk of infection we so we have to ensure prophylactic antibiotic covering uh, uh, biliary pathogens and antifungals as per the patient preoperative flora and immune status and the procedure related events in fact if fever develops a thorough examination is required which includes x ray ultrasound of abdomen cultures and it has been seen the measurement of procalcitonin may be may add useful information however procalcitonin levels may increase transiently for about first 24 hours after transplant and thereafter they decrease if there is no infection present it could also be uh, affected by the kind of immunomodulator used finally one of the aim is preventing graft rejection with where the immunosuppression comes into the play generally uh, use in immunosuppressants are corticosteroids cyclosporine or tacrolimus one could consider using as a thiopine or mycophenolate to reduce uh, cyclonurine inhibitors renal toxicity and autoimmune liver disease we have that to adapt the treatment to renal and hepatic function and underlying finally once we are giving immunosuppression we have to monitor the hepatic allograft function and it is, begins intraoperatively as we have to know that transaminases generally rise during the first 48 to 72 hours post transplant period and then they fall start falling rapidly in next uh, 48 hours or so and generally they will normalize by one week early elevations could be indication of preservation injury how uh, the peak levels generally are less than 2000 in fact if the per, their level elevated levels are persisting it should raise a concern and should require persistent uh, further evaluation we should regularly reassess the liver function test initially maybe every three three to four times a day in the initial first couple of days unlike hemodynamic monitoring online monitoring of liver function at bedside is not available 
satisfactory hepatic allograft function can be indicated by normalizing lactate levels and correction of metabolic acidosis and improving hypocalcemia. They are the initial signs of a liver recovery. Then later on, it is also indicated by improvement in coagulation profile, decrease in transaminases level, stability, adequate urine output, and diuresis restoration, and temperature normalization. Hepatic graft function could be adversely affected due to various factors, which is could be donor-related, recipient-related, intraoperative event, or anal graft-related. So it is important to correctly diagnose the cause of liver dysfunction and as each cause has its own unique treatment. So common causes could be primary non-function or initial poor function, it could be rejection, it could be due to technical complications. Most common causes are include primary non-function and hepatic artery. Thrombosis generally primary non-function is less often seen in live-related transplants. Acute rejection is relatively common, but it is uncommon cause of a graft loss, and it can be managed by increasing immunosuppression, which could be corticosteroids or cyclonevirin, or adding additional immunosuppressants. Various technical complications could be expected. And we should anticipate if there we see the graft malfunction. It could be hepatic artery stenosis, portal vein stenosis, biliary tract obstruction, bile duct leak, hepatic vein or venacoval thrombosis, small to size syndrome. So they all lead to liver graft uh, dysfunction. The detailed discussion is beyond the scope of this talk. As is being seen. Uh, for last one decade, every surgical procedure, there is a lot of focus shifting towards enhanced recovery after surgery. Uh, so few uh, authors have tried, there is not much about uh, ERAS, but uh, in liver transplant, so this is one of the initial papers where the authors tried in the enhanced recovery. They had a fast track group where they tried to cut down the surgical duration, and if I reduce any hepatic phase and uh, minimize cross clamping. So uh, they found that fast track procedure effectively reduced the ICU stay and hospital stay without adversely affecting prognosis. It, it showed that fast track protocols are safe and feasible. However, this comes with a caveat. As we see, the conventional group was bigger. Not every patient is a trans. Um, candidate for fast tracking in liver transplant. And uh, they, uh, there could be various comorbidities if, but I would recommend if we cannot practice every component, we could try and practicing the components which are applicable to a particular patient. There could be various uh, reasons that patient might have an extended ICU stay, which could be high peak operative melt score, extended operative time, high vasopressor requirement, pre transplant dialysis, pre operative ICU admission, high grade encephalopathy before surgery, presence of hepatopulmonary syndrome, infection, renal impairment, or requiring patient requiring renal replacement therapy, could be because of respiratory failure, drug dysfunction, or neurological. A few words about our institutional protocol. So we manage uh, hemodynamics uh, and metabolic. Go, we do goal-directed fluid replacement, and uh, where we use uh, fluids and vasopressor to titrate to the target. We preferably use low sodium containing IV fluids in chronic liver disease patients, and uh, we also use 20% albumin infusion continuously to ensure target hemoglobin around 3 gram percent. We re generally replace SIT glosses with initially uh, with gelotusin and later with crystalloids. We have a low threshold for using vasopressors, primarily noradrenaline or vasopressin or vasopressor of choice. We also use tarnipressin in case. We generally aim to have a maximum positive balance around 500 ml uh, on first two days. And then later on, we prefer a neutral to negative balance. 
generally keep hemoglobins around 10 8 gram percent and we uh, actively treat the hyperglycemia to maintain normal glycemia. We generally uh, are extubating the patient next morning and the room at trials are frequent. Uh, we, if required, we will be using high flow nasal cannula. The moment once the patients are extubated, soon they, uh, we start spirometry and chest physiotherapy, and most patients are fully ambulated by day or four. These are the few pictures of our intensive uh, rehabilitation program. Uh, we generally for population management, add on the underside of correction, and we start heparin infusion if the APT uh, is less than 60 to keep the values within the We manage if there is a drop in hemoglobin, we manage by giving transfusion, but uh, we are more worried about the thrombotic complications of transplant. Later on, uh, once the patient's condition stabilizes, which is day three or four, we switch to enoxaparin. Once the platelets are, have stabilized uh, more than 50,000, we also introduce aspirin. Generally, for kidney dysfunction, we do not do active measures except providing homodynamic and organ support, and the kidney and this recovers by day three or four. Renal replacement therapy only if it's indicated. The rice tube is removed in majority of our patient unless they have a hepatic on uh, the morning, immediately after excavation. And following that, uh, uh, we start clear liquids and soft diet by day two or three. We also add micronutrients as supplements for the patient. For infection prevention and surveillance, uh, we care our all of our respiratory patients in isolation facility with emphasis on health hygiene. Provide them broad spectrum antibiotics, fluconazole in prophylactic doses, bortimaxidol for prophylaxis. Antiviral prophylaxis is given in selected cases. We are proactively removing the lines by day four or five in majority of our patients. We are doing surveillance, blood and urine on 44 structures uh, regularly, along with we are supplementing uh, with biomarker evaluation. When not required, we prefer a rapid escalation of antibiotics. Generally, immunosuppression, we are preferring a renal sparing immunosuppression, though triple immunosuppression is given. Initial period, methylprednisone is used. Spectrolimus is added on day three and four or, or after complete recovery of renal function. Mycophenolate uh, is added generally on day four and five to prevent rejection. If required, we use methylprednisone policy for uh, rejection. Generally, this part is managed by our surgeons. While monitoring, initially we are monitoring in basic blood pressure, slow polyvariance, uh, central venous pressure on oxygen saturation, and uh, Along with that, uh, we monitor blood gases, blood sugars, and laboratory parameters like hemogram, LFT, LKFTs, and tracheolimus. We uh, do twice daily ultrasound for initial five days and later when indicated. Uh, if we have a low threshold of uh, evaluating our patients with CT or MRI, if we call. These are our monitoring charts. So here I would like to conclude that Early post-operative management is highly demanding and significant changes may occur in both the allograft and the uh, other organs. Appropriate critical care management is required to support prompt graft recovery and prevent systemic complications. A reduced rate of complication and satisfactory outcomes are obtained from multidisciplinary and collaborative efforts, skillful vigilance, and a thorough knowledge of pathophysiology characteristics of complete liver. Thank you for your patience, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to call upon our esteemed chairpersons and speakers for the question answer session. Please, our chairpersons and speakers. Hey, thank you, Govind. Hi. And uh, thank you, Gaurav, and thank you, Lalit, for your excellent presentations. And uh, I think uh, I'll just ask uh, one question to Govind. Govind, if you have a new setup, 
and we have to choose between uh, Rotom and Tech. Which one you will prefer? Because you, at, as per you said, that Rotom is better in uh, you know finding out and detecting hyperfibrinolysis, and uh, that is one of the main cause for uh, excessive bleeding during liver transplantation. And in respect to the cost, actually. Uh, the cost of Rotom uh, in India is three times more than the tank. So that, that, uh, that's our, you know, cost is also one of the issues in our patient setup. What, do, yeah. what is your recommendation for this if you have to buy it? Absolutely. So, you know, we had this discussion about uh, three years ago when trying to figure out which system to, uh, to bring to the University of Chicago. And we settled on the TEG success by uh, Hermeneutics, uh, that company. And the reason was uh, primarily uh, driven by ease of use and, uh, and, and, and how accessible the, uh, uh, it would be, you know, in the middle of the night trying to get text to, uh, to do uh, quality checks on the Rotem machine became very cumbersome. And, uh, and with the Hemeneutics uh, TEG success system, you can simply have a bedside point of care cartridge system where you insert a little sample of blood and you get results within, uh, within seconds, minutes. And you begin to know what you, uh, you know, prolongation and your clotting time and your, and your, and your R time. Um, yeah. Uh, within within uh, just a few minutes, you you can make those determinations. Not to mention, Tag Success has uh, excellent uh, reliability and validity across systems. So, if yeah. if you use Tag at your at your institution, you can compare that to uh, to a Tag at uh, at, a, at a different institution, and uh, that's actually been published uh, in a study just in in two thousand and twenty. Uh, the high reliability. Okay. If I could, I add over yeah. here. Sure. Yeah. sure. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so uh, in in Rotem also they have this cartridge system where you can just put a sample and it. Otherwise, it's very cumbersome. Like uh, Govind rightly said, it's very cumbersome. You may need a particular technician to come. Nice. But now they have this cartridge <laughs> in Rotem where, uh, of course, it's more expensive. So that remains a huge concern, yeah, yeah. definitely. I think our, I, I don't know, maybe I find tech to be more simpler to interpret. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, more, it maybe it is it more, is, used uh, to, uh, your, uh, more used to tech than more used to Rotem. No, it one, has stood one, the uh, test of time. Tech uh, has stood the test of time. Yeah. No, what, one uh, thing that we haven't been able to get into our cartridges for the tech success is uh, uh, it, that has been kind of useful in, in managing uh, coagulopathy post reperfusion is the heptem component of the rotem. Yeah. So if we're, since we're routinely giving um, uh, uh, heparin uh, prior to IVC clamping, if there is bleeding post-operatively, um, that's become something that we, is less apparent uh, and uh, we're less able to pick up on, you know, you know uh, tell the surgeons that no, it's not the heparin that's causing the bleeding. And are you, uh, Kevin, are you using the, Fibrinogen concentrate in your setup are still, uh, you know, using so, the uh, uh, Yeah, FCC. We use FCC mostly on uh, in obstetric hemorrhage in our at our institution. Uh, we 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 do have it available, uh, but um, and and, I, and we're looking into the cost uh, analysis of this. We found that uh, fibrinogen concentrates they actually cost three to four times more than cryoprecipitate. Uh, there's less manpower that's involved, uh, but part of our analysis, cost analysis, will be uh, taking into account a lot of the wastage of some of the cryoprecipitate that is often just, just ordered. You know, sometimes it takes an hour to thaw, so sometimes you, when you need it or you think you need it, you order it just, just in case, and you may not actually need it uh, uh, ultimately, but, uh, um, and, and, you know, the tag success has allowed us to get the results of the tag back much faster. So now we can actually act on it as opposed to just using it as a confirmatory tool at the, uh, you know, an hour later after we've already given products. Um, so, but fibrinogen concentrates, uh, you know, they, while they're more expensive, we have them available, uh, but we do not routinely use them right now in, in our liver transplant patients. Okay. Thank you. There's some question from somebody. Yeah, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Deer. Yeah, hi. <laughs> I really enjoyed all the talk. 
Hi, Dr. Yeah. Jeet. Of course, uh, how are you, sir? I'm, I'm good. <laughs> A uh, couple of questions to go in, and then probably a couple of questions are on the chat box for uh, Dr. Lalit. So, go in the. You mentioned that you routinely give heparin before uh, cross clamping. So, is it true for all coagulopathic patients who are bleeding profusely with very high INR and low fibrinogen and uh, uh, low platelets, and they are like uh, really bleeding? Do you use heparin in that? Number one, you know, and do you monitor the ACT or some other test to uh, guide your heparin dose? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Um, I think if you're, you know, you're massively transfusing a patient, uh, you know, with uh, with severe portal hypertension, um, you're probably giving heparin in that situation um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But if that patient has also demonstrated hypercoagulability with, uh, you know, portal vein thrombus coming in the in, uh, and and sometimes, uh, you know, the surgeons may actually see in a patient with severe derangements uh, in INR and platelets, uh, they're seeing active clotting on the field, uh, despite the actual coag coagulation derangements, then we'll consider uh, uh, the use of heparin. And, you know, and I think while we while I said we routinely do it, there are definitely exceptions. And uh, like you said, if we're massively hemorrhaging and uh, giving, you know, a unit of blood a minute, uh, then we will avoid giving heparin in that situation. The dose we give is really small, 30 to 50 uh, units per kilogram. We do not uh, uh, monitor the ACT um, for, uh, for, that low, for that dose of heparin. Now, if, uh, if uh, the heparin dose, uh, you know, if the anhepatic time extends beyond, um, you know, um, 40, 40 minutes or so, we will, we will actually go ahead and redose heparin in the patients that we have concerns about hypercoagulability. Um, I think we don't, uh, our surgeons do not always do a, a piggyback technique. I'd say about 50% of the time uh, they, you, they do full clamping of the cava. Yeah, I know one of our surgeons has moved from Chicago and he's quite pro heparin infusion, uh, not infusion, I mean low dose heparin. So my second part of the question is uh, the routine use of epsilon amino caproic acid. And do you even use if you have uh, shown a hypercoagulatal state in your tag or rotem? Still you use, uh, and is it infusion, a bolus, or a particular stage of the operation? Yeah. Um, the, so Dr. Fung is probably the, per, the, our surgeon's actually been the person who advocated for uh, the use of uh, amicar or amino caproic acid. Uh, to be administered during the anhepatic phase, um, I think some of the uh, 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 some of the things that go into the preservatives and 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 what the liver is flushed with is sometimes there's a little bit of TPA that they use when they flush the liver. Um, so uh, I think that the primary pur purpose initially was to uh, to counteract uh, what the liver has been flushed with with this the small amounts of TPA. Uh, but if the patient uh, uh, demonstrably has hyper a hypercoagulable state, um, and you know you're you're kind of talking about very complex different sides of the coagulation cascade, so you're having heparin administration on one side and then giving uh, giving amicar on the other. But uh, I think it's important to recognize that here you're you're targeting uh, um, different sides of coagulopathy, and that balance, that hemostatic balance, is uh, is very complex. Um, I, I think we, generally speaking, to as a simple answer, we we would if if, if someone's really hypercoagulable, and uh, and and we're you know redosing heparin, we would probably just say uh, we'll skip the amicar and we only give a small dose of it as it is, only about um, you know, one to three grams of amicar. Um, and the use of tranexamic acid uh, has been uh, we we've used that in our institution for uh, doing Jehovah's Witness transplants. So uh, these are patients that they refuse all blood products except for albumin. We make that a requirement for their candidacy. candidacy. And we do everything we can to try to uh, limit blood loss, recognizing that, you know, they could be hypercoagulable and could develop a clot. Um, but that was, is an accepted risk of the procedure. So these patients, we take them to the operating room and throw, you know, run them on a tranexamic acid infusion and uh, use things like octreotide to help decrease uh, splanchnic uh, uh, congestion and, uh, and decrease portal pressures uh, and to decrease bleeding. We've done um, now three 
zero transfusion uh, Jehovah's Witness cases in the last one year. Uh, did you uh, optimize the hemoglobin levels with uh, erythropoietin? Any experience on that? Yeah. Um, so one of the patients came to us completely not optimized. That was uh, that was suboptimal. Uh, the two of the two of the other patients were on iron and EPO therapies perioperatively, um, and so. Um, that, that's a great point. You know, that, that's really key in, in their management. And the other part that we did was uh, in management of their uh, intraoperative um, um, uh, blood product use. We used cell saver and we used uh, normal volemic um, uh, hemodilution. I was coming to the cell saver. I didn't want to interrupt so Dr. Achal actually. wanted to yeah. know about the use of cell saver. Yeah, we routinely use cell saver for all our patients. So mm -hmm. we also did uh, Jehovah's Witness, but patient had HCC. This is about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, our surgeon at that time was quite reluctant using the cell saver in a patient who is uh, have, who's having malignancy. Of course, now there is evidence supporting that even with uh, malignancy, one can use cell saver, you know, cell salvage. So yes, we routinely use cell saver for all our uh, liver transplant patients, specifically for one particular surgeon who has moved from Chicago. So he's quite fond of uh, using uh, all the technology and he actually requests us to use the TE and the cell saver and uh, all the gadgets available. So yeah, cell saver definitely helps. And another role I find cell saver is uh, if patient is bleeding profusely and you're giving massive transfusion, the potassium is rising, patient is in a renal failure, there is zero urine output, and you are worried about uh, hyper uh, uh, potassemia. In that case, what we do is we give units of uh, bank blood to the perfusionist and they, they actually basically wash the cells. And a good quality, do two washes, there is basically zero potassium in the uh, bank blood at all. And we can massively transfuse that as well, along with the cell salvage. So that is my take on uh, cell saver. That's a great strategy. You, and can I add the, Yeah, of course. Uh, so in cell saver, basically the key for the successful use of our cell saver is to remove the free hemoglobin from the circulation, which, is actu which actually causes all renal dysfunction and the coagulation dysfunction in these patients. And now it is very well recommended to use even it in the oncological patient, but the condition they have said that you have to use it with the leukocyte depleting factors and you have to irradiate the blood before, transfu before transfusing it back to the patient. That is what they have said it for the oncological patient. And is it possible to do all of that in the theater? Leuco depletion and uh, irradiation? while yes, you're collecting it? I have personally not used it, but yes, okay. I, I don't have, maybe these are good. Yeah. Yeah, no, those Actually, are like all our uh, blood, I mean, whatever blood bank in uh, Canada is, is all liquid depleted. So mm. that is- like No, the, the cell saver blood, but which yes, is coming in the section. Yeah, that I do not know. And I don't think it is possible. Mm to do in a very short uh, time frame. But it is not leukocyte depleted. It is actually a leukocyte mm -hmm. depleting factors which are added to the blood. Mm -hmm. well, that so is that, something. Uh, so that the malignant cells are eaten up by those leukocytes so that they are not transfused back to the patient. Yeah. I think you can use a leukocyte filter in that event yes, before yes. transfusion. Just incorporate a filter and it will take mm -hmm. care of it. Right. Yes, sir. But irradiation... I do not know how would they irradiate the blood. But the other thing we, if we see that the hepatocellular carcinoma patient, overall they are well preserved when they reach to us in the operation theater, they don't bleed much. We actually yeah. don't have to use a cell saver in those patients. No, they, they, if they are post taste post tear, they will yeah, but bleed. Still, but still most, most of these patients are under the mild exception. So they are, what we have seen at our setup, they are like well preserved patient. They have a good build up. So they perform very well when compared to the other patients. They don't bleed much. Yeah, you are very right, Gaurav. This is all about the mild or this, uh, the recipient sickness basically dictates the your management and your uh, results. 
So can I ask a quick question to Dr. Lalit? Yes, sir. How are you? Two, two, hi, hi. two questions posted first uh, because they have uh, posted these questions. So I'll let me ask those first. One is your post-operative analgesia, the choice of opioids, number one. Uh, particularly opioids, but your overall uh, analgesia management for the recipient. Number two, your threshold for uh, blood transfusion. Any guidelines? These are the yeah. two questions posted on the chat box. Yeah. Uh, so uh, good evening to all once again. And uh, so pain is a very variable factor in, in the chronic, particularly chronic liver disease patients. And uh, there are a few who ha uh, have a lot of pain, particularly those who are well preserved, those who, have, who don't have much of societies, or those who are getting operated for malignancy because they also generally don't have much of society. Okay. So we generally individualize the approach uh, for pain management. Initially, we see uh, it is not like we start a blanket pain management therapy. We initially see uh, at times the patients uh, when they are getting awake uh, while still being on ventilator, they start telling. So that time we start uh, giving them uh, small fentanyl boluses, which could be 0.5 microgram per kilo. But uh, later on, uh, we uh, we uh, individualize. At times, I have given even IV uh, intravenous PCA fentanyl or morphine, but uh, that is very uh, small number of patients in the past. But uh, generally, if the patients are complaining of pain, we also give trimadol. And if the pain is there on day three or four, uh, I would look at uh, start looking at certain pathology. It could be some intra-abdominal collection or hematoma, which could lead. So we need. Uh, abdominal scanning uh, for that uh, as well. And so uh, other pain management modalities uh, are not used epidural. There would be concerns though only, I don't know how many centers there are. I've read about it that certain centers have used epidural in preserved patients, but I have no experience of using. I would be concerned about coagulopathy. These patients develop their function and then removing the catheters later on. And uh, so and that and uh, then uh, non-opioid analgesics, generally uh, because of co coagulopathies, I'm not going to giving any non-steroiders. These patients have liver dysfunctions, enzymes are not settling and, and the liver is new. Uh, and we don't generally give paracetamol till uh, the enzymes show recovery and they're less than twice the normal values. So uh, second part of the question about the uh, blood transfusion, I had highlighted the ideal values of would be around eight to 10 gram percent. We are not particularly chasing any uh, PT INR or APTT value with the transfusions of fresh frozen uh, plasma or unless platelets are also less than 20,000, we are not transfusing until unless there is a clinical bleed. And then uh, we also resort to viscoelastic testing, the thromboelastrograph. Uh, before taking any uh, decision on uh, transfusion of components. <clears throat> so uh, I have one question, Dr. D and everybody. Uh, we have two patients recently after ALF and they had a prolonged ventilation and uh, they had, you know, peripheral neuropathy, severe motor weakness. And uh, what is, uh, you know, Lalit, uh, you, had, uh, you have, uh, must have reviewed the literature for post-op problem. And uh, this ALF patient who was ventilated for five to seven days, then had pneumonia, was tetrastomatized. Then after 15 days, when we, you know, started weaning off, we found that uh, his upper limbs and lower limbs both were very weak myopathies and it needed a lot of physiotherapy. And uh, even after one month of their admission to ICU, they were still not fully recovered. So, uh, primarily this, uh, what we call critical illness, neuropathy yeah. or myopathies, yeah. they uh, develop and these particularly patients who are requiring prolonged ventilation and the reason being, uh, Sed uh, prolonged sedation, so a daily sedation breaks would be helpful, and particularly avoiding benzodiazepine-based sedation uh, uh, would also be helpful because if benzodiazepine-based sedation, I mean we are generally using propofol uh, infusions uh, for in we can use for 
three to five days. But uh, it, it was daily sedation breaks and spontaneous breathing trials uh, are quite important aspect of preventing. So, uh, it's uh, easier said than done. Uh, it is always sometimes it is difficult to be now. Yes. And supplementation. Yeah. Supplementation. Uh, 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 okay. I basically I don't do intensive care at all, so I will not be the right person to Are answer you? your question. And uh, no. maybe other people in the group in the panel can discuss. I may have a question for Lalit later on. Let us uh, finish this portion of the question. Uh, I think what Sarah was describing, this is classical ICU record weakness. We uh, find it quite often, particularly in medical patients who are admitted with, say, respiratory failure, COPD, those, those group of patients, uh, when uh, their ICU stay is going beyond uh, first week into second week and third week, we uh, start seeing patients with this kind of uh, critical illness, polyneuropathy, myopathy. So it's quite surprising that in this group of patients, the incidence is very high, like literature says around 50 to 60%. So as Dr. Lalit suggested, like sedation breaks, uh, using non benzodiazepine sedations are important. And another important factor is that to use uh, early mobilization, like in-bed mobilization by using different devices. I'm sure Dr. Lalit has been already doing that. So, so these kind of uh, various like cyclings, uh, assisted physiotherapies. So uh, we should, I think, start doing these things quite early, early second week of uh, illness. So that will uh, help in reducing these weaknesses in uh, important ways. There are few other techniques suggested, but uh, not with a lot of conviction. For example, hypocaloric feeding, delaying uh, parental nutrition, etc. But early mobilization, I think, is very, very important. In our experience also, uh, early mobilization, I'm sure Dr. Ralit is also doing it. Limb physiotherapy, passive limb physiotherapy, even in ALF sedated patients post-operatively. And uh, supplementation of uh, micronutrients. This uh, yeah. often helps. And, imp and also uh, being very particular about the sodium levels and not allowing it because CPM becomes very common. I have a question for Dr. Lalit. Could I ask a question? Dr. Yeah, Lalit, good to see you. Paper. Very good to see you. Uh, Dr. Lalit, aapne, you talked about uh, use of heparin in the post-op and you talked about uh, anticoagulation in the post-op. I am uh, very excited to know a little bit about it because that is one thing we have never managed to use even for thromboprophylaxis in donors or in recipients, even in pediatric age group. There's always a... A pro and cons which you have to weigh so we've never See, uh, my and this anti-cooperation prophylaxis for me uh, does not begin as early as dr govin would do just even before the cross campaign but may, for many of our patients now we start if the, the thromboblastograph is normal post reperfusion and uh, uh, platelet count is above 50,000. Uh, and uh, then if the APTT values are less than 60, we are starting uh, intraoperatively in a low dose infusion, targeting the APTT uh, between 45 to 60. For pediatric patients, uh, we are targeting a bit higher because our concern for uh, we are more concerned about thrombosis than bleeding. Uh, in this, uh, we are uh, we are kind of weighing uh, towards more towards having the man to perforate. So by uh, it, uh, why we use heparin, it is short acting, easier to reverse if uh, needed and in, intravenous, uh, since we are using an intravenous brain. And we are titrating as for the uh, value which we are repeating every four to six hours uh, for APT. By day, day three, four, when we have uh, established uh, the and streamlined uh, uh, value, his liver is functioning well, that time we switched to uh, low molecular weight heparin around one milligram per kilo of enoxaparin. And if the platelet counts are above 50,000, we are starting um, as, aspirin, low dose aspirin at 75 milligram because, as I said, our concern, because 
um, you lose the liver uh, graft and the patient. We don't have a lot of cadaveric uh, donations around in Delhi and CR. So if we, if we lose the liver graft, uh, we don't have any options. Patient may not, the family may not have a second donor as well. So uh, uh, this is in this is in pediatric patients, I believe. No adults. Also. Adults. Oh my. Oh wow. Yes, At pediatric. I said we are keep targeting a bit higher value, which is up to we are accepting up to eighty seconds of APT. Now, okay. and we are choosing and to give him okay. we are starting we are oh mm -hmm. that that's something really different because we are still hoping that our patient is not going to bleed in the post op <laughs> for us it's the next 12 hours are the most important patient should not bleed so no, we are we are early into it well i Thank have you. a question for dr lalit uh, you mentioned about ERAS protocol in your uh, presentation. So yeah. uh, I would be interested to know any specific uh, components of uh, protocol which we have been using in your uh, setup. See, uh, uh, we are not doing a prolonged fasting, uh, first of all. But uh, as I said, it has to be individualized. Suppose uh, once we pay, uh, we, uh, uh, many of patients, uh, our patients like ERAS protocol, they say they don't, they are the paper which I cited, they don't even use a rice tube. But many times, what we see is that these patients have, might have a stasis, gastrostasis problem, so delay, which could lead to delayed gastric empty. So, uh, not everything, but early mobilization. And uh, because many, as it is also the analgesia component, no, it is. Uh, as such, we are not there. Many of them don't even require any analgesic. So we could say opioid sparing and early stoppage of sedation and early extubation, early mobilization. That these are the key components which we are using and the goal directed flu threat. Right. Uh, right, from, uh, right from the period of intraoperative continuing to the post operative. We are the same team continuing. With the intraoperative and post-operative care, so the goals uh, uh, continue to be the same, and the whole team is aware uh, about each and every event. Right. Yeah. They are saying the time is up, but is there a possibility of uh, some more questions? This is an interesting discussion going on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to know about uh, post-op management of patients with uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome. Uh, we recently saw a patient in the very severe port, uh, sorry, very severe hepatopulmonary syndrome, and we canceled the patient uh, just because, of course, uh, there will be hypoxia. These patients do not improve immediately. May need uh, ECMO support, VA ECMO. We have had one ECMO on 18 days, and after that, patient passed away because sometimes hepatopulmonary syndrome may take few months to one year also right. for fully recovery. Mm -hmm. So any specific strategy or any more experience you guys have about- uh, uh, I don't have much of experience, but the few I've had, uh, we have uh, tolerated the lower values of PaO2 if the patient came to, because the patient's physiology, uh, I would say, uh, is already adapted to uh, on a lower oxygen value. It's like a uh, patient is already uh, living, has been living on a high altitude for years. So the, his, <laughs> their organs. But, but, uh, yeah. If I'm sorry to interrupt you here, yes, that is very true. But the problem is with the new graft. New graft. The, yeah. the donor is used to full normal oxygenation. Yeah. Now you give a hypoxic thing, and liver dysfunction will happen. The graft will start suffering. So, yeah. so there has to be kind of right. to. There are more experienced people uh, in the group. They uh, might prefer to answer about it. Uh, I have a limited experience on uh, dealing with patients with HPS. Uh, is, uh, I would leave it to the house uh, if there, there are um, anybody else uh, would like. What about controlled hypercarbia, Dr. Achan? Because carbon dioxide is a very potent uh, pulmonary vasoconstrictor and a mild hypercarbia of about 48 to 50 millimeters of mercury is also known to be a potent vasoconstrictor. Has anyone tried it or has it been reported in the literature? No, sir, this is not reported. Very true. Yeah, that is a normal physiological effect. But the problem with hepatopulmonary syndrome is uh, uh, there are sometimes there are two types, you know, that especially the very severe form will have an AV malformation also. I mean, people can go for uh, 
uh, like uh, coil embolization of those uh, which are known AV malformation. Uh, this vasodilation of uh, liver disease uh, with, uh, <clears throat> with it is so bad that it is about at least 10, 15 times the normal. Yes, definitely hypercarbia mm -hmm. will work and it has been tried. Even the prone position, hypercarbia, garlic, but ultimately with very severe hepatopulmonary, one has to resort to things like uh, ECMO support, PA or VV ECMO. And uh, uh, so, so we I, also I, had a patient. Sir, I we think, a, sir, hmm. we had an experience of few cases of HPS. What we learned from our experience is that uh, if you don't have a backup of ECMO, you should not do. And the and actually a key to success for the management of these patients is a correct selection of these patients. Basically those yeah. patients who have a PAO2 of less than 60, even after giving 100% of oxygen, they are the one who should not be taken up for the surgery. That is what they say. And, and if the PAO2 comes beyond 60 with a good backup of ECMO, you can take up this patient. Because few years, few years back, it was an absolute contraindication to take up a case of severe HPS for the liver transplantation, but with the increase in the expertise of the surgery and anesthesia, now it has come into the indication. But still, I think we should yes. we should be very specific in taking up the patient, specifically of a severe HPS patient. Yes, Gaurav, you're very right. After the MELD exception points were given to uh, HPS cases in the West, they did a there was a study published by Goldberg where he analyzed all the cases of HPS who were given meld exception points and this has been uh, like a suggestion that all those patients who had very severe hypoxia less than 50 between 40 and 50 I wouldn't say 60 but 40 to 50 on 100 percent oxygen should actually not undergo a transplant because otherwise even if they, they are on ECMO forever and ever so you can't have a patient on ECMO they will succumb to something you don't and we had to also cancel a case for the, for the same reasons because the, after the intubation and 100% oxygen, the PO2 did not improve beyond 40. So the new liver does not work on such a low PO2. Is it okay if I jump in? Uh, I had one comment on the, um, on, on, on the uh, topic of pulmonary vasoconstriction. Uh, one of the medications I think is, is perhaps ripe for study in HPS patients is, the, is a newer vasopressor, angiotensin II. Uh, which is a potent uh, uh, pulmonary vasoconstrictor. So, in addition to using, uh, you know, physiological mechanisms like hypercarbia to uh, to cause pulmonary vasoconstriction postoperatively in the management of HPS, that may be something that uh, I'm not sure. You know, we we just got it on formulary about a year ago, um, but might be a target of of, of 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 intervention and study in the future. Any any experience of using garlic garlic in this patient? Garlic preoperatively garlic capsules. Yeah, Cap they are prescribed. Oh. Now we had one patient of hepatopulmonary syndrome, and we actually published that also. He was on oxygen for one and a half years, uh, post post liver transplant. So. And especially of very severe hepatopulmonary, usually they will have AV malformation. So it's a good idea to go for pulmonary angiogram and to rule out whether they have or something can be done to those uh, AV malformation. If uh, the organizers may allow, uh, can I have one question to Dr. Govind, please? I think that should be the final one, Dr. Lalit. Please go ahead. Okay, <laughs> sure. Dr. Govind, when you, uh, you said you use uh, heparin, uh, when, do you do a thromboelastic graph or rotem before uh, giving heparin uh, before pre-cross clap or? Uh... Yeah, so we'll have the, 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 the TAG study from before the patient comes into the operating room and another one drawn in the operating room. And, uh, you know, and I think a big part of this is, you know, we recognize a lot of our decision management it's all done as a team. So we, you know, we, we engage the surgeons every time, even I, if, if I may say, you know, I may say the word routine um, anticoagulation, but this is, we, we, we have a discussion with the surgical team every single case. Um, so, so yeah, we, we have the, uh, the tag coming into the operating room and then we have a very careful assessment of what does the surgical field look like? 
and um, and uh, so yes, that 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 is something that we all kind of decide as a team, and and based on on all, all of the perioperative factors, including the labs. Uh, we don't, like I mentioned earlier, we don't uh, uh, have ACTs or, and we don't have a HEPTEM that, that's part of the ROTEM. That, that study doesn't come out in the, in the TEG success, which is a small limitation. But uh, part of our discussion, when, if we do feel strongly about anticoagulation uh, prior to IVC clamping, um, is to remind the surgeons that you know, we can always give uh, protamine to reverse this. So. Yeah. Thank you. And it is always a team effort uh, in liver transplant. Yeah. Completely. I mean, a lot of everything that we do, it's, it's so important to get everybody's feedback. And I think this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you for including me in, in this uh, amazing community of, of anesthesiologists. I just really loved all the talks and really appreciate everyone's questions. I look forward to hopefully, you know, joining you in the future and, uh, and then learning from you because these discussions are and it's so, it's so wonderful to see how people do things in other centers. And um, so I just wanted to express my gratitude to you. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, wonderful discussion and nice words. Uh, I place on record my appreciation and regards for the webinar coordinator, Dr. Deepak Tempe, sir, and ably supported by uh, Dr. M.K. Roda, sir. And uh, I thank all the speakers uh, for uh, their talks, Dr. Vimirewadi, Dr. Neha Garg, Ma'am Lakshmi, and Dr. Deepak Tempe himself, Dr. Govin, Dr. Gaurav, and Dr. Lalit Segal. And they were very ably moderated by the chairpersons, Dr. Manish Chanda, Dr. Ashish Malik, Dr. Sanjeev Vaneja, Dr. Shweta A. Singh, Dr. M. K. Roda, sir, and Dr. Achal Deer, who shared his valuable uh, experience with us, and Dr. Dalim. Uh, I, we named it as a webinar, but it has turned out to be a half-day CME. Uh, we started at three and it's four seven and uh, but the wonderful uh, discussions which followed the lectures made it the day and uh, this is a very uh, specific topic uh, for the anesthesiologist and it has generated interest and i can see that there are uh, more than 1200 views uh, for this webinar as of now itself and subsequently uh, it will be posted on isa website also so I thank you all of you for sparing your valuable time and interacting on living donor liver transplant with us today. Thank you very much. See you in near future very, very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, Gobind.